You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and right here... Jared Mounts with Jake's Bait and Tackle. We got a really cool guest today. We are hitting the Susquehanna River system. You want to bring our guest in? Yeah, so uh, Chris Gorsuch, uh, I guess we met probably, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago now. Um, he came down and uh, did a little seminar for us, and we had kind of a meet and greet, and uh, did a couple different seminars, did a great job with that. Um, he is the owner-operator at Real River Adventures, and the cool thing about guides, they spend a ton of time on the water, mm-hmm. so where a lot of us, our job... Uh, you know, we can't get out as much or as often kind of the weekend warrior type thing. So it's, I'm always anxious to hear from guys that spend a lot of time on the water. So, uh, Chris, thanks for joining us. And if you want to just start off, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what got you to this point as a guide. Thanks guys. It's uh it's actually great to be here. It's uh snowing outside. So, um, I'd rather be no other place That's than right. right here, right now. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's the, the guiding world is um, it's a fun one. I think it's a lot more people think a lot more of it than there actually is. And you, you hit the nail on the head. If you spend five or six days on the river, some 200 plus to 230 days on the river, you're going to learn something no matter who you are. Right. Mm-hmm. Even the the most challenged of us will learn something when you're on the river that much. So mm-hmm. the magic is just basically being there and watching what's happening. It's not we're at, nothing special about the guides. Right. We're just. Time Gosh, on the water. I hear it. that a lot yeah. too. Time, Time on, on the, water. the water. What got you into it? So, uh, really, a, a, a friend, Greg, uh, was guiding. He had started guiding, and he, his take on guiding was he wanted to, you know, wanted to be more of a guide. He wanted to make sure that he had been on guide trips that were that didn't quite fit his mode of what a guide trip should be. You know, so he had some really cool ideas, and he was getting really, really popular, and. He started to get into these two boat outings and didn't have a second boat. So he called me up one time and said, hey, I need a guide for this year just to help me with a few trips. And um, would you be interested in doing it? And I thought, nah, nah, I don't think I really want to do it. And, you know, he pressed. And so I got my guide's license and got my applications and permits and and did it and did the first trip with him and absolutely fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time, I was working for Bell Laboratories. Intel was the, the, the company I was working for. And it paid very well, but I didn't get anywhere near the enjoyment I got out of being on the water. <clears throat> hmm. And, um, you know, just not not even fishing myself, just watching people fish, mm-hmm. helping people fish. And, you know, I had I had some um, some teaching in a, in a local school that I would for computer science and setting up labs and stuff like that. And I enjoyed that. But um, it was through Bell Laboratories and this being on the water and teaching and helping just just mm-hmm. hit a mark, even mm-hmm. though the pay is nowhere near what engineering was. Mm-hmm. It was just something I was falling in love with. And then, um, you know, I got an opportunity to to do it for seven years part-time. And uh, uh, another opportunity in the boating world opened up where I could go to Missouri and uh, be the operations manager at a, at a small boat company. Hmm. So I took an early retirement, went there, uh, never planning to come back to Pennsylvania again. And, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, Missouri, Missouri is the home of quite a few sportsmen as mm-hmm. well, right? Yeah. So they have small mouth spot, large mouth rivers everywhere. And I was working for a jet boat company. It seemed like the fit of a fit. And unfortunately, that didn't work out. In a year or so, I was back here in Pennsylvania. And I had signed an agreement when I left for early retirement that I wouldn't compete against my own company <sighs> for two years. So my wife said, why don't you guide for full time mm-hmm. and see how that works out? And um, I heard exact words about two months into it is you need to never go back to engineering. Your smile's back. You're much more pleasant That's to live cool. with. And so that's what we've been doing ever that's since. Awesome. Isn't that a weird thing though about life though? Mm-hmm. Like what, like finding that balance between mm-hmm. like you could pay the bills and, mm-hmm. and probably live well off, but you're dying inside yeah. almost. Yeah, you can make less to, and be happy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it really is a good life lesson for all you guys at home. You know, don't just chase the money. Mm-hmm. If you can find out what your passion is, even if it's a little bit harder work, it's probably healthier for you in the, in the long run. So what was it, what is it like actually starting up a guide service? I mean, back then, did you just start doing flyers? Like, like how did that all so out. i i had a i had a huge advantage so i wrote i started writing yeah. um for outdoor magazines um i did features in outdoor life field and stream 
did a couple little pieces for Bassmaster magazine. Oh, I was cool. on staff at a at a state magazine for a long time, I think 26 or 27 years. So that helped because my name was recognized. Um, we did a small, real small TV show for a while called Backwoods Angler. There was some recognition with that. And we did a lot of like seminars. So mm -hmm. I didn't, uh, getting the getting the people to come and getting your name, it just, mm -hmm. it was a progress of decades where I really wasn't trying to get my guy business mm -hmm. up. I was just involved in outdoors, right? So it just, that kind of worked. So I didn't have to spend a lot of time finding it because there were people who knew me because I was very involved in the early days with jet boats, right? Mm -hmm. Helping people get them set up right. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of great mentors there, you know, Tom Snyder of Snyder Boats and, you know, Kevin Turner of, of River Pro Boats and even the guys in California, you know, that were very, very, very helpful with, you know, a lot of my articles early on were not just about fishing, but how to get to the fish in a jet boat. And mm -hmm. in the 80s and 90s, there wasn't a lot of information out on that. So kind of made an accidental name for myself in that mm -hmm. realm. It's kind so, of crazy how fate happens like yeah. that. Like it was yeah. set up that you were supposed but to I do But I was this. never going to, I was going to write. I was never going to be a, a guide, right? I was going to fish and write and I love photography. The guiding thing just kind of happened. Like mm -hmm. you said, it was something I just fell into not without realizing how much mm -hmm. I was going to enjoy mm -hmm. it because I really pushed and screamed not to do it <clears> at yeah. first. How does that work with, and, and I, this might be veering off, but like when you're working for a big publication like like Woods or Field and Stream or Bassmaster, do they tell you like we want an article like uh, in this time frame on this subject or is it like when you get struck with inspiration about an article, you write it and then you pitch it to them? So like, all, the, that dynamic? all the big ones were more about uh, destination pieces, right? Okay. So Susquehanna River mm. was at one time listed in the top 100 destinations for smallmouth. So when you get established and they have you contact, and then of course you meet a lot of writers along the way who would say, Hey, would you like to write a small little, mm -hmm. I mean, some of these things were 500 words, okay. right? So real small, but just, you know, a little op piece about, Hey, this is what, this is what fishing the Susquehanna is about. Mm -hmm. okay. And so some of them was hosting, you would host a, a writer from that place. And, oh, cool. and so it was, you know, it was just one of those things mm -hmm. where you were guiding without guiding. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it, it, on the bigger populations, they, publications they tell you what you're writing for you don't get to pick okay so it's um and it's these were op pieces they were stuff that you weren't on staff you would just present they 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 pre either you present it to them or somebody else that have got this guy that fishes the susquehanna mm -hmm. river he's got he's been writing for two decades would you like to you know mm -hmm. do a piece on mm -hmm. that's really cool so so <laughs> most of our river rats in this area know about a jet boat <clears throat> but there's still a lot of people out there that yeah. that don't you say jet boat, you know, they think of a jet ski or different things. So kind of talk a little bit for the listeners and viewers that, that don't have never seen a jet boat, a fishing jet boat, kind of right. talk to the boat you're running and, and why a jet boat on the Susquehanna river. So, you know, the, the term jet boat automatically, you know, creates this fast because it's a jet thing and, mm -hmm. and they have evolved into some speed over the last couple of decades. But initially when, when you talked about an outboard jack and Dick Stallman from outboard jets out in mm -hmm. California was the one who invented the lower unit that you could take and put on almost any 20 horsepower or larger boat. Mm -hmm. um, the technology for that has not changed. It's still as mm -hmm. it was when, when Dick, the late Dick Stallman designed it, but that marketplace <clears throat> allows anybody in a shallow water to take a prop boat, mm -hmm. And with the proper adjustment of their their transom to put one of these units on. When you put a unit on, you you have to raise your in, your engine about six to seven inches to to get it to work. But that allows you to go from a running depth of somewhere between twelve and thirteen inches to four or less in with these outboard jets. But the cost of it is beyond the cost of replacing the lower unit, which is expensive. The cost is that you lose about thirty percent of your power mm -hmm. because of the way that the water comes into the intake mm -hmm. and then spins it around and then pushes it out and creates the thrust that you need mm -hmm. so it's it's really the suction that creates the 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 thrust for you not the mm -hmm. stuff that comes out i mean it does add to it but it's not really how it works and then you get into inboards which is what i'm running but inboard is a bit more efficient so if you lose 30 percent of your power on a um on an outboard jet and say an outboard jet you'll see like a uh, 64, a uh, 60, 40, right? So it's a, or 40, 60, right? So it's, it's a 60 horsepower at the power head, but you only get 40 horsepower out of the bottom. Mm -hmm. When you get into an inboard jet, the power is almost 90, 98% of what the power is at the power head. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you have the right impeller, it's sharpened and all your stuff is set up. 
Um, basically, it's just a giant water pump that sucks the water in. And that process of sucking the water in, not pushing it out, but sucking it in is what, what, what moves you. Mm -hmm. And so now these things are 200, 250, 300 horsepower. Dear God. And you're, you're hitting speeds, you know, at, at well, well over 45 miles per hour, sure. which is the first time. But just note, if you had a 200 horsepower prop, on a bigger boat, you would go seventy, mm -hmm. right? That's so right. it's yeah. it is not still not speed. as a, yeah. still not as efficient as a prop, mm -hmm. you know, boat is. But I remember too, like I remember my dad had one had the prop outboard, but they would put a pitchfork, the bottom half of a pitchfork, underneath of it to protect that as you're going up. Sure, and we all did that out so that it would you mm -hmm. hit a rock, it would, it would fly up. So sure, back would, yeah. in the day before the yeah cages and yeah. Uh, and and uh, pitchforks mm -hmm. and the max <laughs> ring that you could put around the the prop. I mean, we all cut our teeth on that you know so come a long way come a long way does an inboard versus like an outboard i mean this might sound like a dumb question but does an inboard have a shallower draft than let's say a tunnel haul jet boat uh, because of the weight of the sure. engine or sure it, it, two two factors one is that an, in, an inboard literally the lowest piece of that boat at any point in time is the boat because mm -hmm. the engine sits mm -hmm. inside the boat and is it depends on who manufactures it but it's either flush with the bottom of the boat or it's tucked in okay. a half inch to four mm -hmm. inches, depending on how big the tunnel is. Now there is a sweet spot there, but that's another conversation. But you can, I would say that in the right type of water, I can skim over two and a half inches of water. You know, stupid. Where, where a lot of the outboard jets think they can and find out that they can. Mm -hmm. Okay. So an, an inboard jet would definitely, I think, run shallower. The value of the outboard jet is you're not married to that engine. Mm. So if you put a Rotax in your boat, you're married to road tax. If you put a Mercury Sport Jet, which they're not making anymore, but there's still, you know, there's still a few of those engines around, you're married to that engine. I mean, it takes quite a fabricator to swap those engines out because of the the way that the engines are set and the way that the, the jet pump is. But if you have an outboard jet drive and your engine blows, you have a choice of buying a Tahatsu, a Yamaha, okay. an Emirud. Well, Emirud has gone now, but Mercury, mm -hmm. Honda, Yamaha, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just you have you're not married to that engine anymore so you can buy any boat you want and fix any engine you want you're not married to it mm -hmm. so from a financial standpoint the outboard jet while not as efficient you're not married to that power plant mm -hmm. as you are with, okay. a, with an inboard now are you is it a two-stroke engine that, that's running in your boat or is it a four-stroke so i'm running the 200 sport jet i've run the okay. 200 and 240 i have two boats both 20 foot long okay and i, I run two boats because i just when your boat is down yeah or you run it that much you don't have time to always do the necessary maintenance on it. So mm -hmm. having two boats allows me to cancel less, if that makes mm -hmm. any oh, sense. Oh, yeah. It's right? like that's how you make your living. Like, so yeah. it's like having two tractors mm -hmm. or two trucks, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just for me, uh, the maintenance on a jet boat is, you know, especially in a shallow river, you're going to mm -hmm. bang it around and, right. you know, you, you're going you're gonna to run into maintenance problems. <laughs> and I just happen to have two of them, uh, one from the place that I work for in Missouri and, and another from Snyder Boats. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's the best solution for me. But you know, with that comes, you've got to service two boats, mm -hmm. you've got to run yeah. two boats. But it, it's just one of those things that that works for me. Mine are both two stroke, and I know a lot about two stroke and not so much about the four stroke. <laughs> so for even though I'm not the most mechanically inclined person, I can still wrench and mm -hmm. get some things done and stuff I can't do, I can get a friend or a mm -hmm. person that that to, to take care of it for me. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's one of those things where I'm very, very familiar with the Mercury okay. two stroke. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, if you're going to buy a jet, most of them are going to be four strokes. All of the uh, Rotax engines are four stroke engines. Okay. That's interesting. Wow. Yeah. Let's start, jump into the Susquehanna, the mighty Susquehanna. Mm -hmm. We have a ton of guys in our area that you know shop with us that make that trip uh, about an hour and a half to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, up straight up 81. Yep. And then from that, um, east or west, there's a lot of water. Kind of talk of water. about where you spend most of your time and maybe some of the different ramps or areas that you you fish on the susquehanna so i live in an area that's called west harrisburg so it's across the river from harrisburg it's on the west side mm -hmm. and i am anywhere from 10 minutes to 40 minutes from about 10 different launches wow. it might be more than that wow. as far as Ten the number launch. of launches uh, most of them are public or municipal launches. There's very few private ones, but even the private ones are reasonable to get into mm -hmm. um, as far as price and availability. I mean, it's, so there's there's almost an endless, I don't, people call me up and say, hey, where are we fishing next month? And I'll mm -hmm. say, well, we're fishing the Harrisburg area, but I don't know where we're fishing <laughs> right. because that river does some turns and it's pretty mm -hmm. big. 
and I'm going to call you a couple of days before and tell mm -hmm. you exactly where we're going so that, you know, within within 30 minutes of, the, of, of yeah. where you're going to stay or where you're driving, just so I pick the best wind, the best location mm -hmm. for what I feel is going to give us a good day. Plus, I, I, I like to fish different ramps all mm -hmm. the time. Some guides have a home ramp and that's okay, mm -hmm. but I, I like to fish, you know, multiple mm -hmm. spots and for our dc viewers at home that don't quite understand like the vastness of the susquehanna would you say the susquehanna is wider in parts than like what two potomac's put together two shenandoah's put together like it's freaking wide i mean it's a big river the potomac river they're used to it's probably comparable i would say it's a lot bigger than the shenandoah i mean yeah, it's probably like, three or four shenandoahs so yeah, the joke the old time wise. joke from my pap and back in the 70s used to tell me the susquehanna river was a mile wide and a foot deep <laughs> but the truth of the matter is it's probably a half to three quarters of a mile wide and 18 inches deep right yeah. so that's really the the, the, the joke about it is yeah. it's not mm -hmm. there's a lot more rock than water in the summer and it's a it can be very wide i mean i i we have some islands on there that are mm -hmm. you know half mile long and i'll go guys guys will go well, this river is not as big as I thought it was. And then I said, well, that's an island. Mm -hmm. It's just as big on the other side right. of the island as you go across yeah, it. Right. Or you want to run to the other side of the river and you realize, you know, it's you're, you're burning some fuel just to run directly across the river. I mean, it's big because I know we have a lot of people that listen from D.C. that go out to Watermelon Park and float mm -hmm. or do a little mm -hmm. boating. They're like, oh, let's go kayak the Susquehanna. It's mm -hmm. like the Shenandoah and the Susquehanna are completely different animals. Yeah, like, I think <laughs> the, like the sheer volume of water coming yeah. down the Susquehanna is it's such a, it's a more powerful and we're obviously biased to the Shenandoah, but it's just yeah. it's such a powerful river. Now, in saying that too, the smallmouth are powerful too. I mm -hmm. mean, it's it is a great smallmouth fishery. The Susquehanna is a very unique river. I think it's one of the oldest rivers, if you know, geologically mm -hmm. that we have. Um, it's as the mountains go, so do your your ledges go. So in that river, if a mountain is running perpendicular, that red ledge is going to run right. perpendicular. Mm -hmm. So if you're used to a river that you know, the ledges all run across the river and there's a holes in it. We have mm -hmm. plenty of that. Mm -hmm. But you get up around a bend where that mountain line is mm -hmm. running that, that hmm. geologically, those those ledges could be every 20 feet mm -hmm. running straight up river. Yeah. And the problem is, is that when that knife edge is pointing into the current, you can't read it in a boat. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you are. You're not mm -hmm. going to see it till you're on it. And the color of that river is black on the bottom, very oh, wow. much like the Lehigh and the Delaware. It's very dark. Hmm. And so... You can come with the, you know, you get a little bit of chop on that water and it, yes. it, it, in shallow water, it could be, you know, a rock rock tap, you know, type game that, for your boat. Yeah. And that Dun Duncanon stretch, I noticed too, I, I was on the opposite bank and just to get from one side back to the boat ramp, like in the summertime, like in July, you, you literally have to, like to your point, take that channel yeah. up to find a seam to scoot over. You can't go from point A to point B. Yeah, the, You have to navigate. The Dolphin Narrows is one of those really fun places that goes up up through, you know, from 400, Harrisburg to mm -hmm. 400, um, comes up along the mountain and it makes a really hard uh, right-hand turn in Duncannon and, and comes up into the Montgomery's Ferry area. Mm -hmm. And you, there is, there are sides of the river where they're easier, you know, but you have to know when to cross that river and at what level mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and when you can come off plane, right? Sometimes you come off plane a little too soon and mm -hmm. people do damage to their boats. How much is the, do they have any good mapping for the different so, uh, electronic brands out there? Or is this all just from years of experience that you know where to run and how much can you rely for the people at home, like rely on mapping? One of the funniest things that Tom Snyder has ever said to me is, you know, you, you know about hit, hitting rocks is you can't miss them all, right? <laughs> so, you know, it's, there's, it's just a sheer number of rocks and it's not a question of, of, of if you're going to hit rock, it's when you're going to hit that rock, right? Mm -hmm. So I think everybody who has maps would be telling you more like, this is where the island is, the name of the island, this is the street that's near it. Mm -hmm. They're not, no one's telling you what a channel is. Like you can get a Delaware River map and it tells you the channels. Mm -hmm. You're not getting the Susquehanna River out there telling you mm -hmm. how to run it, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, you could you could be in a, literally, you could be in a hole in 400 that's, that's 17 feet and you go... 100 yards in any direction and now you're in four foot of water or less right so it's there's just it's 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 just holes and pits mm -hmm. and there's a lot of stretches that are just literally 18 inches deep for the, forever mm -hmm. it's either dry rock or 18 inches deep and then you'll find a spot where there's three three and a half foot and that's where your bass are mm -hmm. so it could be it could be just a washout from the, the ice created it could be a washout that's created by a, a secondary eddy it could be a washout that's created by a small scrub island but those little differences like i mean guys in the delaware would go you know hey you know what depths am i going to be fishing today it's like mm -hmm. three four feet right they go no 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 really i mean we're going to be fishing no no we're going to be fishing in three to four feet mm -hmm. it's summertime and we, if we can find four feet we're going to mm -hmm. find a, a pile of bass right they're used to being able to find 
eight, nine, 10, 12, 15 foot of water all summer long. Hmm. Similarly, on the, on the north branch of Susquehanna, where it's it comes through the mountains, it's probably a, a third to a fifth of the width, and it's it's got depth because it's just mm -hmm. a deeper amount of water deep coming water. through there. All, all things being equal as far as weather conditions, water, water conditions, what is your go-to place? Where do you prefer so, of all of them? Spring and fall and a little bit of winter. So I start, I'll start in, you know, the first week or so of March and I'll run right to, you know, the end of May because that used to be the closure. Mm -hmm. um, that used to be the more the, 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 the closure due to the moratorium, which mm -hmm. is no longer in existence. You can now fish for bass year round hmm. without any harm. It's still a catch and immediate release. Now, whether that immediate re release means that you can weigh it or you can, you know, if you see a, a picture with a guy holding three or four bass, they're probably not in our stretch because mm -hmm. ah, it's an immediate okay. release. You can't throw them in a live well. You're supposed to, you, know, you can grab a quick picture of it, but you're not supposed to put that bass in a live well. You know, you almost all the tournaments are paper tournaments where they measure them. Gotcha. And um, there's no, you have to go above Sunbury to get to that place where you can start throwing fish in a live well. Because hmm. it used to be during the, the spawn, to your point, they closed the season. You could not fish or target you, smallmouth. You could not target it. It was a very, very, very tough rule for the state mm -hmm. to enforce mm -hmm. i think it was a great rule okay. and from a guide i'm probably one of the few that would say, say that, that rule should mm -hmm. be back in place hmm. um just because even though you're not targeting a spawning ground you don't know from year to year and level to mm -hmm. level where those fish are going to spawn mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. how fast when they fade off of the spawn area you know are you targeting a mm -hmm. female that just laid a thousand eggs or mm -hmm. ten thousand eggs right and, you know, you can feel when you catch one that's weak. Like, we've caught, like, really big, you know, smallmouth that as soon as you put your hand in their lip, to, you could feel that they're exhausted. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had to break people's heart and say, hey, we're not taking a picture of that fish mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. She obviously just came off of a bed or is just in, in her, her, you know, three to four day recovery. We're not lifting this fish mm -hmm. out of the water. But that's, you know, that's more of your April, May type things. Once mm -hmm. you get into June, July, those fish are fine. And that's what I tried. I know that comes up here too and like you said the guys like to you know show the three or four or five fish and that's and i'm i hear from both sides you know and i understand what they're doing whether it be a tournament angler i understand too the because the river is so just with water levels it's such a hard place for these fish to spawn and if you get a high water event you know that will wipe out that you know age class which we can't control that but at the same time it's it's to your point you know, I try to encourage them. If you do catch them, like you're saying, catch them, you know, get them back in as quickly as possible. A good Don't rule put of thumb. Them in your live well. Yeah, yeah. A good rule of thumb is hold your breath. I used to tell people, hold your breath, mm -hmm. right? Right. That's catch a, good a fish, point. just hold your breath while you're right. taking the hook out of it, get a picture. And, you know, most of us can hold our breath for 30 seconds, mm -hmm. and that fish can certainly handle a minute, right? Mm -hmm. So I just used to tell people, hold your breath, you know, have mm -hmm. your camera. Like I, these smartphones nowadays, you can set it up where it's a one push camera. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have to go open it, put your password in. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of these things are, you know, you push one button or two and you're at your mm -hmm. camera. So be ready to take the picture. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you will, if you get a fish that, that's that's uh, deep stuck, you know, the, the water's right there. Mm -hmm. Just just put them back in the water as you're working through with them. Mm -hmm. And and you're going to, fishing creates mortality, right? right? And as guides, we're probably responsible for a, a large number of mortality because mm. we're catching so many fish. And mm. if it's an average and we are on, on the water at more and we catch more fish, then mm -hmm. ultimately you have to realize that the math the says that you're going to be mm -hmm. you're causing more mortality than you're willing to admit. Mm. So I just think that as guides, we more than anybody else have mm. to handle the fish a little bit better. And I, think I net it. almost every fish, even if it's 14 inches. It goes in my rubber net and I hand it off to the, the client in the rubber net it's just mm -hmm. it's just for me it's easier i don't have to worry about broken lures or yeah plus it, it gives me a, a, a hands-on to touch the line to see okay mm -hmm. your line sprayed mm -hmm. you need to, i need to tie another lure on for you right and, and that's something that we've I've, I've always argued and debated with with some of my friends about you know bass versus mlf and, and no matter what you think of mlf the catchway release what mm -hmm. the kayak does and they do that might be the future mm -hmm. because no matter how much we love the five fish weigh in, when you get to catch and put that fish back immediately versus mm -hmm. throwing it in a boat and then running it all over God's earth, right. you're going to decrease the mortality mm -hmm. rates. And I think mm -hmm. that's just, if we're not going to have states that are really big into restocking, we have mm -hmm. got to take care of the future mm -hmm. of, of our, of our resources. I here. mean, let's be honest. The, it, this is not the, what the tournaments were when I was a kid did a lot for the sport, mm -hmm. did a lot for the popularity of sport, did a lot for lure development. Mm -hmm. did a lot for management the way that they handled those fish in those days was not 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Primo. And I'm not saying that these fish are delicate. I mean, this is these bass right. are not yeah. a delicate fish. Right. They can take, you know, they can take a little bit more than, you know, a lot of the other fish that are in the in the fishery can do it. It's not like fighting a muskie for 15 minutes and then nursing it back. Those bass are landed within 60 to to 120 seconds, right? They rarely are they on that far. And I've had guys come out with with fly gear and they want to fish with 2-pound tests, so not on my boat. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to break a record, you go do it in somebody else's boat. Mm-hmm. I'm not about, you know, this is not about something you can put on your wall and say, mm-hmm. hey, I landed this four pound bass on two pound test. Mm-hmm. You want to do that, you go someplace mm-hmm. else, right? And the key with this too, though, is it's kind of, it's the future class. I think if we, yeah. if we as fishermen look at this as we're protecting the future class, it's not that, that bass so much as it is, it's the, the five, six years from now, right. that class of fish is what we want to, because we all enjoy catching that four or five pounder yeah. so that's no i don't know. subscribe to the that you can't hold a fish by the lip right, right? Mm-hmm. i don't subscribe to that at all mm-hmm. i i think that you know if it's a long fish like a muscular pipe mm-hmm. pike you've mm-hmm. got to hold that fish in the mm-hmm. middle but i think a bass you know pick the picture that's going to present well to you mm-hmm. don't crank the neck i mean that's pretty obvious yeah. right but if you get a one pound fish and you're cranking the neck you're not going to break that fish's no. neck now a four pounder you don't want to crank its neck you mm-hmm. want to be a little more gentle but to hold it perfectly vertical or mm-hmm. horizontal I don't think there's a huge difference. Mm-hmm. I mean, I we catch a lot of the same fish. When I mean, you get, especially in the summertime, right. you start to get to know these fish by name, right? That's why mm-hmm. I like to fish the same spot <laughs> two days in a row. So, you know, you get to know these fish because you can see scars on them. And, you know, you, there's only so many 22-inch fish in the, in the water. You catch that fish two or three times during the year. You know that fish by name, right? But, you know, those fish get handled by a lot of anglers. Mm-hmm. And I would notice if, you right. know, if they were dying because of mm-hmm. how people are holding them. Now, again, I don't crank their necks yeah. and I, you know, I don't like that, you know, that ripping them open when you, when you, you get them and I prefer to lay them back in the water. But even if you toss it in the water, it's as long as you're not making it do backflips or throwing it 15 feet in the air. I think that, you know, I think that there is a, there's a level of, of protection that you can give them, but you can almost go over the board mm-hmm. With it, I mean, I see a lot of it with the magazines. They don't want you holding the fish vertically; they want them all horizontally. Yeah, and it, I just don't know that I mm-hmm. subscribe to that. Yeah, and it's just the micromanaging of the conservation right. versus thinking big picture. And, and I want to get back to fishing, but I definitely want to like, what is the broad overview of the the, the life cycle of the Susquehanna? Because I remember, correct me, what years they were, but there was a time where like that was the hottest fishery when it came to smallmouth for a huge stretch where it was like, it was number one where you're catching just absolute massive sacks. And I, and I believe that also correlated with the, oh, the massive crayfish boom where there's tons of crayfish in there. Like what are, what have yeah. the cycles been like on the Susquehanna? So Susquehanna is hard to read it because it, it does have a pollution factor to it, right? There is, there is a municipal pollution factor to it, okay. which is kind of funny why the state doesn't want you to hold a fish in their magazine <laughs> this way, but they're perfectly okay with dumping 3 million gallons of- crazy. Could you talk about that too, about the pollution situation? So I just, it, it's it's a, almost an unsolvable problem quickly, right? So you have, we all want to live in a house. Mm-hmm. We all want to have rush, fresh running water. Hopefully, yes. And if we, right? And if we have are on certain drugs, we, we take those drugs and a portion of the drug goes to take care of the ailment that we have. And a lot of it goes into the toilet when we, if I can be as raw, right? Mm-hmm. It goes into the toilet. And a lot of these municipal water treatment plants were never set up to take care of some of the the toxins that are that are that mm. are now in our or medicate medical stuff that's in our body mm. right now. So pharmaceutical from that standpoint, that's one of the issues where these these older facilities that are now treating the water that comes out of our house can't handle certain mm. waste certain products. Right. Yes, yeah. let's put it that way. <laughs> and then the second thing is is that because our municipalities are growing so big, we have malls, we have three lane highways you know, our, our sewage drain that's coming out off the water, rainwater, sewage, the farming practices, uh, they're just not able to withstand, you know, a community that was once a thousand homes, now it's 2000 homes. Mm-hmm. And so when it, when it rains, we get two inches of rain you know, overnight, the sewage just goes directly through it. They have to bypass it because there's no way to keep up mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. that much water and treat it before it goes back into mm-hmm. the river. So, it's a combination of raw sewage. It's a combination of untreated ground sewage. It's a combination of farming practices, which I'm not picking on the farmers. I mean, I come from a family of farmers, yeah. right? You want to get your product on a, as much of your product to the consumer as, as you can. So you get a nice warm day in, in spring, you're going to start to fertilize your ground. Mm-hmm. And now you know what's coming up here. It's the end of end of March and we're going to have 
20 degree temperatures in less than 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Well, if it rains during that process, where do you think all those, mm -hmm. all those mm -hmm. plowed fields chemicals are going to go? Right. So you have a nitrate issue in the, mm -hmm. in the river and you don't know temperature plays a big role and, mm -hmm. and a lot of it affects us locally, but the further South you go, the worse the problem is going to get. And I know that was a big thing too, because I want to say it was early two thousands. We were fishing and it was really hot. We were just, you know, canoeing at that time, but, um, and it was the Shenandoah river went through a fish kill. And then it was like only like one to three years after that. I can remember, cause I remember talking about, oh man, this, this Susquehanna fishery, you know, and then, but then those next couple of years, it just was not good. And it was, it was like the Susquehanna followed the Shenandoah. Right. And I know a lot of the biologists were all talking, you know, West Virginia, Virginia, Pennsylvania. And it's, and to your point, I, I think I agree with that. There was no, everybody's looking for that silver bullet. One Blaine down here was a poultry farmers or whatever, but I think you're right. I think it's a multitude of mm -hmm. things. Uh, it's a it's a very difficult thing to solve. Mm -hmm. it, it it could be this. It could be a spawn in low water, mm -hmm. yep. right? Where the the fish are out of the current, mm -hmm. where you don't have a lot of dissolved oxygen, and those fish, because it's warmer than it mm -hmm. normally is, mm -hmm. are more subject to colonaris and things like that mm -hmm. that can affect them when they don't have you know mm -hmm. the more more water, right. right? So yeah. it's about it, mm -hmm. it, there's just some things that you can't control mother right. nature mother nature yeah. and timing of that and yeah that yeah. was worse than i think a lot of the a lot of the pollution that's coming right just being mm -hmm. super low super warm that year mm -hmm. it took out some of the fish Correct. but they they rebound i mean they do they're they're very resilient i mean they rebound so the fishery now compared to let's say 1990 you're not catching 50 fish behind a ledge mm -hmm. by sliding across that same ledge during the day now you've got to go and and and, and find those mm -hmm. fish but because of the lower population, you're still getting great numbers. Right. But you're also getting these four and a half to Good five size. and a quarter pound mm -hmm. bass that honestly, you just didn't see a lot of those fish in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And then working, I mean, we're going to, I guess, work into the more of the fishing stuff that you guys want to hear. But let's, I want to talk about the environment. What is the, what is the forage and habitat like on the Susquehanna? Like, what is the primary, because we talked about this. Uh, a ton with the Shenandoah River. Like, is there a lot of vegetation? What is the primary habitat that that is inducive to creating these four pounders? And then, what is the primary forage species that these these fish? So go the after? Susquehanna has three, I believe it's three native crawfish species mm -hmm. and really? four evasive or non-native. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between non-native and inversive. So, you know. Years ago, they said, "Well, these crusties, these these rusty, I've heard rusty, it. yes, okay, yeah. these rusty crawfish were were a danger because the, the smallmouth won't eat them." Hmm. I, I don't know where that came from, but a smallmouth's going to eat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's not a flathead catfish, but a smallmouth's going to eat whatever it can get fit in its mouth. And right. It while it may prefer a three inch crayfish over a four and a half or five or six inch crayfish, which mm -hmm. I'll buy into that. I see those gigantic claws that are very mm -hmm. telltales about what a rusty rusty crayfish looks like all over my boat after catching a fish trust me they're 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 eating those fish mm -hmm. now it does it does relocate some of the indigenous or push out some of the indig mm -hmm. indigenous things which is from a um, from a, a fish commission standpoint is reason for concern but mm -hmm. the smallmouth it's like what the goby did in the great lakes mm -hmm. right the gobies did incredible things to the Great Lakes from mm, from the right. bass population, right, right. but they almost decimated the localized crayfish population. Mm. Now I remember too. There's been years or times I've been up there, and, and I've heard this said, and I've, I've witnessed it. So many that literally looks like the bottom of that river is moving. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's so many of those. those yeah, you, fish. yeah. I wish we had our big TV <laughs> up here so rusty crawfish can get over five inches long. Yeah, it wasn't exaggerated and, when I said four to six. A oh. mass. It's like a freaking lobster. Because I remember the new river. Mm -hmm. uh, well, because we used to vacation when I was really little. They had rusty crawfish, mm -hmm. and it's so crazy that get, they got introduced, and all of a sudden these massive smallmouth started really showing mm -hmm. up. It's like you're giving them this big cheeseburger mm -hmm. to start eating yeah. on. And I and I think that there's a, there's there's a lot more calories mm -hmm. in oh, yeah. that versus plus not that you don't have to chase crayfish down but compared to compared to chasing the emerald shiner which is in the river mm -hmm. or the the you know any other type mm -hmm. you know, middle forage it's suckers things like that yeah, yeah. The, the the fall fish the suckers mm -hmm. the blunt nose the, the the dace the darters all those things that they're chasing along mm -hmm. the bottom they don't have to they don't have to, have to spend the energy mm -hmm. so 
more calories, less calories spent getting it, you know, you create a bigger, a bigger mass. Now, what, with, with the introduction of this, um, did you, did you see as a guide, a, a change in any of the fishing behavior? So I know example is with the goby, uh, influx, those fish that were pelagic, they're always swimming. All of a sudden they're like locked down in specific areas because you're dealing with a, a bottom moving kind mm -hmm. of, of creature. Um, are the smallmouth in the Susquehanna now more primarily bottom feeding oriented towards crayfish or is it seasonal based on, you know, the different hat like behaviors of the forage? So this species? is why the smallmouth have a special place in my heart. They're going to eat whatever they're presented with. Mm -hmm. Okay. They really are. I mean, it's, there are times when they're certainly dialed into the bo mm -hmm. bottom where they're looking down at the bottom. And, you know, we've all experienced those crazy top water bites mm -hmm. and we've all seen where they'll chase something. You'll, you'll be reeling a lure back on a high speed mm -hmm. reel mm -hmm. and, and you get struck at the boat uh -huh. and you know, that thing's moving at, at, mm -hmm. at rocket speed. So I always tell people you can't out reel a small mouth. Now they mm -hmm. might want it slow, but you're not going to out reel if they want it. So yeah, I think that, that during the summer months, they're more homey, they're more homebodies. They're not moving a lot. You know, you can find the current seams and they're going to be fish there where now they come out of the winter, the wintering mm -hmm. areas, and mm -hmm. if their spawning grounds eight miles up river, they're going to move a mile, mile or two a day, and they oh, may wow. rest for a couple of days. Hmm. You know, and this I explain to people one of the reasons why I move is because I'm trying to follow those fish up river, right? Hmm. And there's pods of them that are coming up, and they don't all spawn at once, which is another one of those things that people think they all spawn at a certain time. Mm -hmm. I think there's probably three different times that they're spawning in the spring, and it goes by class, it goes by you know how ready they are. And where they're coming out of, because some of these creeks are cold water creeks, some of them are warm water creeks, and the river itself, of course, holds springs where the, the fish could be are, are are warmer or colder depending on where you are on on, on the river. So, the, in the spring, you're chasing those fish, right? And in the summer, you kind of have your resident fish, and in the fall, you have those fish that are just feeding because they got to get to their wintering holes, and so you're following them back and forth their wintering holes. But they just got to eat because they know mm -hmm. based on water temperature, length of the of the daylight that they're keyed on to, to feeding so if you recognize what time of the season you're in you can kind of dial in mm -hmm. what you want i mean you could always catch a fish on a tube i think right soft plastics it should always you should always have a tube rod in your boat but you know there are other times when throwing a swim bait or a jerk bait or a spinner bait or a crank bait you're going to have a lot more activity than you would you know with just a soft plastic, mm -hmm. but one, you can always catch them on. No, absolutely. Yeah. One thing I've always said too, with the, the moving water, the dynamic of moving water for them to eat and get big, they've got to be aggressive. So mm -hmm. they don't, they're not like, like a crystal clear lake, you know, it's not moving. They have time to sit there and evaluate it. But on that river, the more they wait, they're not eating because it's, it's gone. Mm -hmm. The current so it's, is moving it's food. It's the so opportunistic gotta, feeder, right? Yeah, that's so, right. So, you know, People say, well, how did you know that fish was was, was that in that spot? Because I say, oh, there's a good spot. You got to hit that spot. And of course, mm -hmm. I catch a fish on it. It's like, why is it there? It's like, that's a feeding area, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're hiding behind that right. rock with their nose almost mm -hmm. up against the current line, mm -hmm. waiting for something to sweep around that rock. And they know when it comes around mm -hmm. that rock, they're almost going to be helpless. Mm -hmm. helpless. They're going to dive out into that current thing, swing back and, mm -hmm. and just rest back where they were. And the better the spot, the bigger the bass generally, right? Mm -hmm. The biggest problem is summertime when you have all, everything in the water now is feeding. Mm -hmm. And... You know, if you've ever if you've ever had a teenager in your house, uh, you know, you buy three pounds of ham and two loaves of bread and two days later it's gone. Right. No older adults going to eat like that. But a teenager is going to eat crazy. So mm -hmm. people will come to me and say, well, why are the bass smaller in the summertime? It's not necessarily they're smaller. Mm -hmm. It's just that those teenagers are eating. And if you've ever seen anybody mm -hmm. feed fish in like the bat uh, into like a big aquarium. Those small fish are just stupid mm -hmm. and rocket. I mean, they're, they'll come out of nowhere and eat it, right? Mm -hmm. Where I think that the older bass, not that they're wiser, but they're a little bit, you know, lethargic, you know, coming out of it. And and they're going to look at it a little bit longer than them once ago. Oh, I just want to fill my belly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? And that competition, too, you said something earlier, made me think, too, how many times you're, you've got a nice small mouth on, you bring them in, and then another one will come. I mean, there's like, they're like packs, and they'll, mm -hmm. they'll literally, like, I mean, just... I mean, yeah. it's such a the two bass on a crankbait scenario, right? Yeah, one yeah. hit it, and the other one's trying to knock it out of its mouth and yes. hits that bad yes. hook, and now you have two yeah. on, right? fighting over the food. Yeah. What's, what's the primary um, habitat? That is it kind of just is it just rocks and laydowns? Is there a lot of different types of oh, it's, aquatic it's vegetation? It's everything. It's sand. It's mud. It's rock. It's a lot of rock. Um, if you get the, the first few miles of the Juniata, it's got a lot of eel grass, grass on it, oh, and really? then we have. Okay. We have a, a grass on the island that's a, got a super strong root system. It doesn't grow real tall, but it's it's dense and it, it the crayfish and the 
I mean, you'll see it three or four feet into it. Where you'll see some kind of a bass or some kind of a, a feeding fish, a game fish in there feeding on it. Hmm. And you can't get to it because, you know, it's, the, it's, it's grass. But if you throw to the edge of the grass and hit the grass, sometimes you can rip that bait out and you'll, you'll get the fish because the fish are literally nose up into that grass. Mm -hmm. So there, it's, what's great about it is it has blowdowns and it has ledges and it has chunk rock and gravel and it has big pools and riffle areas and ledges. Mm -hmm. There's just so many casting points. You can, in certain areas, you can look at and go, where do I cast to? Because, mm -hmm. you know, there, mm -hmm. in the summertime, there's just a million casting points from one position. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you find that pattern where they're, they're along a ledge or at the opening of a ledge mm -hmm. or they're 20 feet behind a mm -hmm. ledge or they want to be on a scrub island versus a, whole, mm -hmm. a big island or they want to be on a soft sand bottom. I mean, mm -hmm. you get on that, those kicks and that's where they are. And, and it can change. And that's one of the, benefits of being on the river every day is like hey they move from sand to rock so the weekend warrior too I, i'm i keep when you listen to you talk dun cannon kind of offers that juniata access the mouth of that you've got the ledges you know from bank to bank i've always said you can spend all day just right there in that area within sight of the boat ramp you got bridge pylons up through there and then you go up just a little ways and you got an island lower side of an island so you know to your point you do you have a little bit of everything going on yeah, you you can be in a very short period of time. You can mm -hmm. be at all different oh, types yes. of, of mm -hmm. things, and I, I I like to focus on grass in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Grass and current, mm -hmm. really. Um, and yeah, I love grass mm -hmm. and current. I mean, not that rocks are bad, but everybody mm -hmm. hits the rocks. Well, it's like it's always I was I was always led to believe like you know smallmouth just don't intermingle in grass like a largemouth will. Yeah. Um, but like that fact that you're saying like a smallmouth will bury himself. Find right the forage, in there. find the bass, right? Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. just it's just huh. grass. This this grass hides mm -hmm. well it breaks the current cleans the dirty water mm -hmm. right so oxygenated it's just, how many times have we talked about aquatic vegetation like with you oh, with you deal with at lake holiday yeah, it's a filter and everyone wants it's, to poison yeah. and kill all the grass like mm -hmm. like florida's dealing with right now where, where they're just destroying like the saint the saint mm -hmm. john's river but you need that aquatic vegetation because like yeah we talk about the pollution problem and everything that helps balance. filter yes it's the balance like, well, you, need too, it there. you talk about reproduction and then when they are fry i mean they can they're they're not going to be a, a as preyed upon yeah you know if, if they're out in open water so it's just a it's all over grass vegetation is all around good thing mm -hmm. i mean and that, but we just need to read that's the biggest thing i think is you need a re-education of that because mm -hmm. whether we're talking about the susquehanna or lake anna it's so that the landowner knows mm -hmm. that this isn't just a hassle for his prop this mm -hmm. is needed for the health of the fishery mm -hmm. and just re-educate and a people. lot of these smaller community type things where they where they kill the grass mm -hmm. all the fishermen are like where the, where, where the fish go the fish are there mm -hmm. yeah. but they've been driven deep because they've got to right. they've got to hide from the mm -hmm. they've got to hide from the elements mm -hmm. and they you know they also have to find forage and mm -hmm. if the forage isn't there then they have to go out to the pods mm -hmm. right now so before uh, last thing before we get into really just the nitty-gritty fishing flatheads okay let's go into it that's a great <laughs> conversation and, and it's it's one i'm a little bit embarrassed about because if you had talked to me about flatheads four years ago Two years ago, I would have not a big cussing kind of person, but mm -hmm. I would have probably been pretty upset with the fact that somebody deposited on purpose mm -hmm. flatheads into the river so that they could catch these things. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still not crazy about it, but I think that the fact that they've put these massive fish in the river mm -hmm. that grow quickly mm -hmm. and are truly an apex predator. Mm -hmm that they've made me a better bass angler because I couldn't just, I can't just go anywhere and catch fish now. Interesting. So from a, from a thinking spot, like, you know, mm -hmm. I have to do more now to catch them, mm -hmm. but I think it's made me a better angler because of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, there was a time when someone would say to me, well, we go to the, we go to the, the Delaware river to, to angle fish and we go to the Susquehanna river to catch fish. Right. So, and now it's, can't say that anymore because now you can't just go behind every rock and catch a fish and some of the winter holes that used to hold bass like um 400 area which mm -hmm. is a big community hole would once have 30 something boats there and still does at times but it's now more 20 of them are fishing for for catfish because really? though the catfish have found this deep spot and mm -hmm. they call it home for the winter hmm. and has pushed the bass off into smaller pockets hmm. Uh, because if you've ever fished in places that have shad runs, have striper runs, the bass aren't getting away from the shad to, because the shad are eating them. Mm -hmm. They're getting away from because they, they just don't want the, the chaos, right? They just, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to catch a bass in this Delaware River during the prime shad run. It's not the boat traffic, it's the traffic of shad. I mean, the shad are coming up along the yeah. seams and, 
you know, they're they're obeying the ledges and everything else, and they're just sweeping over, and those bats just shut right down. And, and for the individuals at home, just from for the knowledge I have, I'm staying neutral on this, but a flathead catfish is more like the Wells catfish that's in Europe, where it is an alpha predator, where it actually actively hunts compared to a flathead or a blue cat that actually does more scavenge for, for dead things. That's why, generally speaking, for flathead, live bait is better than dead bait, because this is a creature that actually does actively hunt, and they get massive. And, and yeah. Well, and, and to your point, a lot of the bass anglers have learned mm -hmm. you can catch these things on swim baits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Large swim right. baits. You can catch them on grubs. You can catch mm -hmm. them on crankbaits. I mean, there's you 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 can catch them now on artificials, which you know, you, not that you can't catch, um, because I've caught plenty of, of channel cats on this, but they're they'll entertain you. If you have the right size bait on, they'll entertain you mm -hmm. when you can't catch smallmouth. For, from you as a guide, because I, I heard Al Linder talk about this on an old show that up north, where, wherever there are pike, you can't usually catch the same smallmouth. They, they pick different parts to locate if they're both in the ecosystem. How has it changed the smallmouth behavior? Is it more or less that if you hook a flathead, you know, like, well, we got to leave because they're not going to be smallmouth here. Like what, what, what has changed about their behavior? So for winter fishing, it's changed a great deal. You have to learn more spots now. You're not going to be able to go to 400 and catch 175 fish hmm. in late November most days mm -hmm. right you're not going to be able to sit on one ledge and have those pods of fish swim by every couple of minutes and and everybody you see watch everybody hook up now those ledges especially the deeper ones are home to hundreds if not thousands of flatheads so mm -hmm. in that body of war that particular area it's changed a lot now you can still catch them you just got to go into the into the different pools you got to go into the shallower water and they're active uh and but they're less protected. So what happens is, is that now where a thousand fish could be behind the top of the 400 pool, those bass that used to be there are now 20 or mm. 15 in smaller areas. So you have to visit more areas during the day if you want to catch your hundred bass during the day. And you got to get, got to get pretty lucky. And the problem too, though, I was seeing a little bit I was seeing online, like the idea was, and they, they say the same thing about the muskie, you know, in the new river, Shandor, like are they, or the snakehead, you know, are they... Predid, you know, predating on the, the, the small bass, smallmouth. Yeah. Be, no, no, no. But I've seen these videos where they're literally pulling a bass, smallmouth. Yeah. So Joe Raymond, the, who is yes. one of the prominent guides in our area, um, he pulls a 19 mm -hmm. or 20 inch smallmouth yeah. out of Crazy. a, out of a, you know, not a huge mm -hmm. fish, but you know, yeah, it's, so yeah. just to take away that, do they, pred do they eat them? They're going to eat anything they can. Yes. Do they target them? I, that's for right. somebody else's kind of dog eat dog world too but, but they're, it, they're such bats how long have they been in the wall how long are we oh talking? i think it's 20 years they've been in there they've been in there yeah. they've just been but they're just to they're at they're at the peak right peak now. of their thing mm -hmm. so they're feeding it's on the same pop. forage it's not that they don't eat crayfish and minnows so they're feeding on the same forage they're, they like the same kind of water in the winter time right they're not opposed to to current but they don't like current as much as the mm -hmm. um as, they don't seem to like the current nearly as much as the channels do mm -hmm. so winter has definitely changed your winter game mm-hmm um, it, right now in 400, you can catch bass more than you can catch these cats because the cats are gone. They're, they're, they've moved. They're not, hmm. some of them are still there, but most of them moved to, to their spring feeding areas and they don't spawn until later in the year anyway. Hmm. But people always say to me, well, you know, what about the, no one complains about having pike or muskie in the water. Well, I've never put a camera down and seen a hundred pike in the water. Right. Mm -hmm. Never put a camera down and seen right. 75 musky in the same pool right right you put a camera down in the winter time in that specific mm -hmm. spot you're you're just going to see channel cat and and flathead after flathead after flathead what has it done to the sunfish and shell cracker populations so i think that that's that's more of the harm mm -hmm. right those those gotcha. fish are they're decimated mm -hmm. right because that's their choice right they're, they love they love all those sunfish right that's their choice and that's what most of the best fishermen get those baits and live line them and catch them. And they're catching the 40 pounders, right? Those are the guys that are doing that. They'll eat fall fish, they'll eat bullheads. So if, you know, your bullhead population is is way down because, you know, the, you know, you used to be able to sit at a boat ramp and throw in with a you know, bucket of worms and catch 10 bull bullheads in mm. a matter of an hour. Mm -hmm. And in some places they're still there, but as these 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 flyheads move up river, um, they're, they're changing it. Are they making it worse? I think they're they're cutting down our numbers, but are, are certainly the ones that survive them are 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 fine. Right? Yeah, because what's interesting to me is 
if you go to like the Mississippi and up north in Minnesota, where they have all three prey, they have the muskies, they have the flathead and the smallmouth, and those ecosystems somehow make it work. And, and to me, it's just the question of, well, then what's different about this? It isn't, well, it isn't water, that. Water, it isn't water. that. It's 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 the angler's learning. So this is where I, okay. the embarrassment of myself, gotcha. right? I hated the fact that these things were in the river, right? Mm -hmm. hated it because without thinking a lot, I could go out and put mm -hmm. people on 50 to 60 fish without even thinking about it, right? Without burning a ton of fuel. Mm -hmm. Now, I think I have to think a little bit differently about how mm -hmm. I'm going to approach this and how much more they're willing to move because the forage isn't there. It mm -hmm. changes the forage a bit. It changes the wintering holes a bit. It changes where the bass are comfortable being. But I think they're going to coexist just fine. Right. I don't think, I think the days of going and catching 100 bass every time you go to the river are out of it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I've been fishing for three, almost four weeks now with the guide season. And I have had days as few as 24 bass in six hours and days as high as 100 plus. I'm not going to use the exact number because it's <laughs> embarrassing too. Because the next guy that comes in goes, well, how could you catch 100 plus one day and catch 24 yeah, the next? Life. <laughs> but it's just, it's just, you're still catching 100 yeah. fish. And if you're, if you're able to get on the bite early and you're able to find those spots and repeat it, you know, you, know, you're, you have an easy day. It's the days where, you know, you have to look for them a little harder that, you know, we want to blame something other than ourselves. So I think that in time, it's going to be a great fishery for flathead. Right. It's going to be a great fishery for muskery. It's going to be a great fishery for smallmouth. It's not ever going to be a good fishery for uh, sunfish mm -hmm. or the rock bass that we used to see a lot of. And not that they're not there. But the populations are not there like they used to. Well, it's just not. an ecosystem, it's all about balance. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything, even the vegetation and for everything is about the balance. And I think sometimes, man, we kind of tend to, we think we can fix it or correct it or whatever, whereas Mother Nature kind of, yeah. And so what's going to happen too? Anytime an overpopulation happens and there's not the forward, they're going to die off. They're going to they're going to come their numbers are going to cycle back around and come down. It's just it is it's literally a cycle, and I've seen it on the river here too. It is a cycle and people come in, they'll cuss the river, Shenandoah River and everything else, but then just give it, give it a little bit of time and, and she turns right back down. She yeah. replenishes. It, my panic mode right is going out. out. I mean, I, yeah. I still don't like the fact that it happened the way it happened, mm -hmm. but they're here. They're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. No one's killing them. They're, they're going to be there. And the guys who are worried about the guys who want to kill them when they catch them, there's millions mm -hmm. of these things out here. You're not going to, but I don't kill anything. If I, if I don't, mm -hmm. if I have a choice, right. If, if, if right. you foul hook something, you've obviously, I've, I've mm -hmm. done, done harm and damage, but it, I'm not going to kill a fish because, mm -hmm. you know, unless it's a law, I'm not killing a fish. Yeah. Well, we had guys, even here at the Shandu, we had guys that were scratching their head, you know, two, three, four years ago and uh, 21 pounds, if I'm not mistaken, one mm -hmm. North Mountain tournament out of uh, Riverton yesterday. So now not, not everybody caught five fish and it was still a tough day, but still you're a 21 pound bag out of a river. You know, this time yeah. here, that's, that's impressive. Much, 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 much rather have the mm -hmm. flathead and the rusty crawfish mm -hmm. and the, slider turtles right mm -hmm. those red ear sliders they're not they're not indigenous either much mm -hmm. rather have all those things in the river than the asian carp oh no. yeah that's all right? yeah so yeah. we're blessed that we have a predator fish mm -hmm. that is fun to catch and it keeps bait shops in business and it, mm -hmm. it's it's i didn't have this view two years ago but as i'm seeing it shake mm -hmm. out and i'm a little a little bit you know watching what's happening i do believe that they do they're going to eat bass you know, bass are going to eat their spawn too. Right, yeah, right. And, and this gets to something that w with what I'm trying to hopefully get going here in the next year or two with our, our little private mm -hmm. thing and more to the, come on that once we're a little bit closer to it. But it's it's going about how do you take care of these fisheries correctly? Mm -hmm. And after starting this podcast and listening to so many people, mm -hmm. the one common denominator I've at least seen, and correct me if I'm wrong, what are they eating? It's mm -hmm. not about like right. we need to stock more musky or smallmouth, but like the bluegill population is mm -hmm. stunted. Well, clearly right. that's the forage, the fathead minnows, mm -hmm. the, the rusty crayfish, the mm -hmm. goby, the trash fish. It's instead of throwing more predators into the mm -hmm. ecosystem, you know, if you want to grow a 12 pound buck, you give them cornfields right. to feed off of. Right. And I think we're so misguided when we think about we have to always restock bass or musky or trout. But mm -hmm. what is the base level of that mm -hmm. ecosystem? If mm -hmm. you have a lot of minnows or a lot of bluegill in there, you're going to grow better, better genetics. Mm -hmm. But it's so weird how that's twisted in our mind. Because mm -hmm. I like um, when we had the guy on from the Department of Wildlife mm -hmm. Resource for Fish Virginia. Mountain. Yeah, it's not sexy. Mm -hmm. to stock trash fish it's not mm -hmm. sexy to stock bluegill right. or, or minnows right. but long term that's probably the better thing we mm -hmm. should be doing mm -hmm. to keep this protected for right. years to and come and see so the delaware river for a while was stocking crayfish hmm. i mean local really people were getting permission to stock crayfish and they were indigenous so they were able to, to get them the right species in and stock a lot of a, a lot of the, the bass clubs were doing it and it, it 
it works. Hmm. The, the thing is, is, I don't know why the Susquehanna is just so prolific with crayfish. I mean, hmm. you sit in a kayak and you're in two foot of water and you look down and it feels like, you know, ob mm -hmm. the water, you're moving and now the water's moving a different direction. You get dizzy because it's crazy. like, how could there That's be that crazy. many? Or if you have to walk across, like sometimes in the middle of the river, mm -hmm. there'll be an area where you literally, it's four, four inches deep and mm -hmm. no kayaks floating through that. And Anybody with sensible with a jet boat isn't going to run through it because that's not good for it either. But when you walk your kayak through it or walk through it, you mean crayfish are scattering mm -hmm. under your feet on mm -hmm. every single step. Yeah. And so, I mean, I've seen years over years where we've had either higher water or bad ice, like we had bad ice this year. That moves stuff in the river. That moves grass beds. Ice does? Okay. It moves. It, mm -hmm. It'll push gravel flats to a different area. And so it'll change where you see your crayfish from year to year. But, you know, come summertime, if you spend enough time in that river, you know, you realize mm -hmm. we do not have a crayfish population problem That's in interesting. our river. Real quick, too, before we jump into tips and techniques yeah. and how to catch these bronze backs, um, talk about this. You're talking off camera there um, before we started the history of the smallmouth and how it was introduced to oh, yeah, the yeah. Susquehanna. Yeah. I think this is fascinating. Well, I mean, you, you know, I have this conversation on a lot of the forums about people being confused with an invasive species right. or a non-native species, Correct. right? So the smallmouth bass is a non-native species. It right. does not, it did not originate in our Susquehanna, That's Delaware, right. Juniata naturally. Mm -hmm. it, it came from the Ohio River Basin um, and it came back in the late 1800s by Thaddeus Norris, who was a fly fisherman hmm. and he caught these things and went, oh my gosh, I got to bring these <laughs> things home. So with permission from the fish commission, he, uh, he rented space in a railroad car, a, a, a cooled railroad car and put these bass in hmm. the old style milk containers, those milk, milk containers That's crazy. That's and awesome. dumped them in Easton, Pennsylvania. And within seven years, people were catching smallmouth like crazy. I think the, I think it was, it was something like four or five per hour. Wow. That's how they exploded on the river. So, the fish commission went, hey, Thaddeus, do you think we could do this on the Susquehanna? And then they did the exact same thing on the Susquehanna. And actually, the there was actually a stock car on the railroad, hmm. because the railroads connect. It was actually a fish commission stock car that was a railroad car where they, and it, it just was, that it just so was cool. out of That's really cool. Yeah, that's so when I so. hear people say that you can't stock yeah, smallmouth, right. it just... That's just not possible. That's right. Or you can't stock um, gobies yeah, or things well, like that. Same thing like, happened like yeah, holiday. It's not native. It's not native. Or, or hydrilla. It's not native. Well, what is oh. native? Tell yeah. me what's native. The problem yeah, with the goby here. is the gobies will push out your crayfish mm. population. Oh, so yeah, if you're struggling yeah. with a crayfish population now and, yeah. and gobies mm -hmm. get introduced, your crayfish population is gone. Right. Yeah. The Susquehanna probably can handle it, but please, guys, don't be stocking gobies. Yeah. Right. yeah. And, and but it's they do they do and come in and, and, and they, they live in the same holes. Mm -hmm. They live in the same water. And they're and they're much more aggressive, right? No, and, and pick and choose. But I, I think that this is again like you need to think where could we stock gobies that would be beneficial because clearly they will make your smallmouth population explode. They're hardy and there's tons of them. Mm -hmm. Hydrilla can be planted in places that are extremely toxic and it'll mm -hmm. filter out the water where other grasses won't grow. You know, the zebra mussels will clean out water, even though there's issues. There's mm -hmm. issues with all three, but isn't it weird where they go all of a sudden the sports fishing explodes and i think and i guess this is my big picture instead of always looking at the negatives can we mm, ever look right. at this and be like how can we maximize this to help something right, right. so yeah, i think that, you know i think the big key here is to not let billy bob and chris gorsuch decide if they're going to put yeah. the stuff in but allow fisheries managers who have the knowledge to do it to introduce species mm -hmm. into the water with some mm -hmm. kind of control mm -hmm. that's that's you know that's the big thing right mm -hmm. just to make sure you're not doing something that harms the fishery mm -hmm. down the road that you that you didn't think yeah of. yeah not that all fishery managers aren't making mistakes because mm -hmm. we're human mm -hmm. too right but i think it's, it's important to make sure that that you go through the proper yeah channels to do it right and yeah. and a lot of these places will allow people to stock i mean up up the west branch of the of the uh, delaware river for example mm -hmm. they've done an incredible thing there with with trout and they've introduced species that don't always aren't always there but they brought that species back will we ever have salmon back in the Delaware, probably not. Mm -hmm. Not in our lifetime anyway, mm -hmm. but they used to be there. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I just think it's re-educating or figuring out where fishing games mindset comes from. Because it's like the rusty crawfish. They don't want that in there, but clearly it does help. So like, where is your mindset and like, how do we evolve our mindset on what is good for these places? And P.S. Yeah. The rusty crawfish bait. If you get a crankbait or a 
a jerk bait in that mm. color that can be mm. lights out for you that's right. mm-hmm. for some yeah. reason i don't know yeah. why it's that way yeah. but for some but, reason yeah it's like the same people that'll say like you can't put the rusty crawfish in there we do want to stock a ton of carp in there to get rid of the grass it's like wait what like doesn't make any sense but then we're going to stock musky but you can't yeah. stock the smallmouth. but it's right. like so be a collaboration there's I a think there's of, a communication disconnect yeah. or an education disconnect Correct. and i think as we continue to evolve with our fisheries we need to evolve our education and understanding Correct. of how to maximize the, right. these places yeah Let's get into uh, how to catch them. You you that you make a living off of catching, so <laughs> yeah, and that's the fun, and, right? Uh, the cat, catching the fish, hooking the fish. So is, what that's, kind of what can fun. you help our viewers and listeners that are river anglers, whether it be the Shenandoah? Think about river systems too. Whether you're on the Shenandoah, Susquehanna, New River. You these, want to start with the Susky and then kind of evolve the from there. Yeah, well, I, I, mean, I, think, the I think knowing the forage is is a big is a big piece. Knowing mm-hmm. the forage, watching the forage, mm-hmm. knowing what they do, how they move. I mean, that all that stuff's going to help you mm-hmm. in your presentation, right? So. You know, it's not sexy, but a tube, a Ned rig is always going to catch. I don't care what time of year it is. They're mm-hmm. always going to catch. And if you want to simplify your tackle, that's certainly a way to go. Um, I like to fish hard baits. I really do. I mean, I hmm. love jerk baits. And I love crank baits more than anything. Although, you know, when the water's below 40 degrees, it's really hot, tough to pull those fish out with a crank bait. But a jerk bait, you know, um, you know, a jerk bait and, you can, and all sizes. I mean, you can throw the two and a half inches, the four and a half inches. It's rich. They're really going to be dialed into maybe something specific, but I've never seen where I couldn't catch him on a, on a 78 and not catch him on a hundred at the same time. Mm-hmm. They might be preferring one. And so you catch more during your day, but the jerk bait is something I think that anglers need to make sure they have on board mm-hmm. during the times when that water is, I'm going to say from 37 degrees all the way up to 60, right? I really think that that's one of those baits you got to have on with your tube mm-hmm. or your Ned rig. Now, before um, you go on, Chris also is now writing for Woods and Waters, and I was um, I went back and read what you would said in there about the bill related to depth mm-hmm. you think is more important than profile or size. Yeah. So maybe talk to Color's that a little bit. Color's always a key, but I, I mean, I, I tend to throw, because I have so many, right? I, tend, I have, have every color. But I've seen guys catch them on parrot, and the next guy catch one on clear. Mm-hmm. But you can't be two opposites at either end mm-hmm. of it. Now, I have seen days where Pearl AU outfishes everything, mm-hmm. and days when Rusty Craw fishes out everything. Mm-hmm. So it's they are dialed into color sometimes. Mm-hmm. But more than what my my worry about the the profile, whether it's a, I mean, I, I was using a 120 the other day, right, mm-hmm. and the other guy was using a 78. The key was. The bass seemed to be really targeting stuff. It was from the bottom up, maybe 18 inches from the bottom. Mm. So either touching the bottom or 18 inches. They didn't want to come up, you know, any higher. So the 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 standard lip, the the, the SP lip, wasn't working nearly as well as a deep lip for us. Mm. And now the river was higher, and we were in a little bit more current. But those fish were just dialing into you know that stuff that was much closer to the bottom. And once we figured that out, the guy who was throwing the 78 on a spinning reel. Or the guy was throwing a 110 on a casting reel, were both catching pretty consistently, mm-hmm. and they were using the colors that they had confidence in. So mm-hmm. color wasn't a big key the other day. So do you think so? Would is depth more important than color? You think day in for day the, out for the for when it's especially when it's cold. Okay, because that that fish wants to look at this for a while, right? And so your pause, you're going to slow and vary your pause, and they're looking at this thing. It's just kind of moving back in the water like this, and they come up and look at it. And sometimes you'll get slapped mm-hmm. and no fish. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they're just, they're, they're testing it. So sometimes if you get slapped a lot, you might know, hey, I got to change my color or my profile. Mm. I've got the right depth, but I just don't have what they want to eat. Mm. But I think depth is more important to where, being where the fish are is key. It's like throwing a crankbait. I'm not saying you can't catch a crankbait when it's two foot off the bottom, but if that crankbait smashes bottom every once in a while, you're going to get a lot more strikes. Mm-hmm. Right? So I I just I love the interaction of a crankbait, and I throw it a little bit, maybe a little bit different than other people. I gotta have on contact, and I stop fishing when I hit bottom. I stop it for a couple seconds, and like this KVD one, you'll hit bottom, and you stop it, it'll start to wobble back up the top, almost like it's stunned, and then you start it back up again. It looks like a crayfish that would just spit it out of another fish's mouth, or mm-hmm. was you know it'll it'll scoot and stop, scoot and stop, and and I don't think anything beats this for that mm-hmm. scoot and stop. When does size matter for a jerk bait and a swim bait? Does it does it ever matter? Or I think it... it does for some people. I mean, obviously in the fall, I mean, those bigger profiles are really key because okay. right? they're really trying to get a big meal. And I think also, likewise, in the summertime, you'll catch a lot more fish on a really small profile than a big one because sometimes, like me, I just was out working 
chopping wood and I don't mm. want to eat a big meal right now. I just want to have a snack. Mm. Right? So I think that comes into, pre- into play. You also have, you know, they're locked into a forage. If you've got a, like in the springtime, sometimes we've got that really big run up the river of those um, uh, shiners, the emerald shiners. Before they spawn, you know, we don't have owlwives as much or that I see anyway. But when you're on an owlwife bite, you've got to trigger the silver and the size to get those fish to eat, those stripers to, to eat. Do you have so, owlwife in the no, Susquehanna? No, I'm oh, saying okay, we don't, okay. but if okay, you're gotcha, in the fishery gotcha, okay. does that. I was like, wow. Our fishery <laughs> has a lot of, um, not that we don't have shad fry, which are very similar in looking, but you know they're shad fry, not owlwife. Um, but we have a lot of those emerald shiners and, and they'll dial into that, you know, that yeah. two and a half or three inch size certain days. And now, if you see that, how do you know that? Is it is it something where you just get on the water and, and you got a feeling that, okay, this is the bite? Or is it you look, you see these mass swarms of them? Or is it a time of year? Like both, right? Both? I mean, sometimes you see it, you, sometimes you'll see the pods of fish and you go, okay, <laughs> we're doing this, right? Yeah. And on the Delaware in September and early October, if you're not dialed into the shad fry that's coming back down river, you're missing the boat. Um, on the Susquehanna, it's nice to know when certain fish are, are spawning or moving so that you can dial into that a little bit, right? So it's important. Mm-hmm. It's Another it. little crankbait tip you thought said, I didn't. I never really thought about this, is the difference on a slack line. Like you always hear about slack line in your jerk bait, but because of the current, talk a little bit about that tip. Right. So, I mean, m- most of you, if you kept Kevin, Kevin and Dan was here, mm-hmm. he would say you got to throw it on a slack line, right? Mm-hmm. But in a river system, that's really hard. And it's not that it doesn't work. But it's not on that slack line for very long before, even if the bait's in the eddy, your line is going to touch the water. Right. And your line is going to be in different current than your bait's in. Mm-hmm. So it's going to pull that bait on naturally. Mm. Right? So you can't keep the slack on it enough. It's just too much work sometimes. So if I'm at a big pool, I'll throw slack line all day. But usually I'll throw it out, quartering down river, jerk it, get it down to where it's going to be. Once it's at that level, mm. the bait's design well, it'll just sit that level and I'll just jerk it as it goes through the paws. And sometimes when you hit the swing, you know, mm-hmm. at the very bottom of the boat, sometimes I just leave it out there like it's a piece of live bait. And once in a while talk and all of a sudden your rod will go off. Hmm. That happens more often than not in a river system. Right? That's a great tip. That yeah. really is. Because you always talk about like if you're bouncing something on the bottom, you're usually throwing up river, let the current do the work. And so to your point, like you always think about boat positioning. And then on that, like you say, you might on that be better off. And I've seen guys that will just, and almost leave it in that, that current line and just keep, even if it may not even move right. directionally, but, you can just, but you're but just twitching it in that strike wobbling, zone. Right? Yep. It's wobbling and it's kicking off. It's kicking off mm-hmm. a little bit of a, of a wake in mm-hmm. itself. So the bass is seeing it because of color. Mm-hmm. They're seeing it because they're feeling it, which is something that I think that we should talk about a little bit about what bass are feeling versus what they're seeing. And I mean, a lot of guys who don't use a jerk in the river are usually working it too hard. Now you, in the summertime, you can, you can burn it. You can mm-hmm. fly, you can, you can rip it. But in the, in the, the patience it takes in cold water to catch them, it's amazing. And sometimes if you're really patient and you can let it sit there for mm-hmm. 20 seconds as eternity, but if you can let it sit there for 20 seconds, sometimes you'll get some mm-hmm. just absolute beasts of fish that you just couldn't catch any other way. Roll with that feeling and seeing because I'm intrigued now. What's that? But you said we need to talk about what they're feeling versus what they're seeing. So, I mean, talk so, to that. so if you get Berkeley's book, you know, the book that was written in the, in the 80s or 90s, it talks about so many scientific things that w- put you to sleep, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a textbook. But they talk about bass, largemouth, smallmouth, spot, and other species based on what they can smell. And people will put, hmm. people will put stuff on their baits. Well, I mean, like, yeah, like, um, help me, Berkeley's Max Scent, like yeah. whatever. The so thing, I don't yeah. know that like a salmon can smell at an incredible Great, mm-hmm. right? So salmon, if you're fishing for salmon, especially if you're throwing spoons and stuff like that, putting stuff on your spoon is probably not a bad idea, right? Putting mm. a herring spent on your spoon mm. is probably not it. But if you think that putting that scent on your bait is drawing the bass in from 10 feet mm-hmm. to hit it, mm-hmm. I, I don't think they have the ability. Mm-hmm. But when they hit it and they taste it, yeah. it makes them hit it again or hold on to right. it longer. So that a couple extra seconds in a cold water bite or if there's short striking mm-hmm. you, having a bait with scent in it or adding scent is a key. Mm-hmm. But it's not for them to locate it. Mm-hmm. It's them once they've hit mm-hmm. it, mm-hmm. it does it. The other thing is that we have no question about being blind as a bat. You know, bats don't have good eyesight. They can see with their own good eyesight. But you can watch them at dusk, you know, drop five feet in a second and hit mm-hmm. a little tiny mm-hmm. gnat or mosquito or other flying insect. You know, they'll just dive and catch that. We have no problem understanding it. But when we talk about the lateral line and the smallmouth, it gets skipped. 
you, no matter how faded a basket, no matter how dark a basket, you always see the lateral line. And so Berkeley's book talks about what frequency bass like, right? And I'm not going to go into what the frequency mm-hmm. is and it's going to change in how fast you do it. But some of these swim baits, you know, whether you're throwing a fit or a Kai tech or a Z man or who knows the number of swim baits out there, you'll wonder why one day one bait works better than the other, but nothing moves like these things do in the water. You lose people like them because you, they, they bite the tails off of them. But whatever that frequency is, this bait has it. That is so interesting to me. because like, So you can lay this yeah. bait out. I'll lay this bait out sometimes, and I'll take a short cast because I don't want it to hit bottom. But I'll throw it on a 124th ounce head in current, knowing full well that I'm never going to go to the bottom with this thing. But the bass are two feet off the bottom, so this bait goes behind mm-hmm. the boat. And as it swings out, I'll just hold like a jerk bait. And mm-hmm. this tail... Even in muddy water, I don't care what color bait it is, even in muddy water, we'll draw fish in because mm-hmm. it's sitting in one location and it's throwing out a message to mm-hmm. them saying, there's something in this mm-hmm. water that's that's swimming mm-hmm. and it's moving. If you're watching the current, it's never really because mm-hmm. current changes. Mm-hmm. And dynamically, I mean, bass can find stuff in muddy water without using their nose, without using their eyes. Mm-hmm. That lateral line is huge. So the... the the, what helps their eyes is how opaque a color is, right? You know, if it's really mm-hmm. clear, it's great for a, a clear water day, right? But if it's really muddy, I mean, I've seen guys catch them on pearl white where that pearl is just so deep in it that if you hold it up to the light, you can't see through it. Mm-hmm. It looks just as black through that light as everything else does. And I think that what's more important than color is how opaque that color is. So like June bug's a great color. Mm-hmm. Black's a great color. Black and blue's a great color. That's silhouette. But even mm-hmm. white, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a, if it's an opaque white, it's it's amazing. Just like just like having some kind of pearlescence in the in it, or purple, or mm. or pink, like we talked about in clear water, it's just dynamite because it looks it looks like the side of that 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 minnow. It's so interesting, like when you say about like their eyesight compared to the lateral lines, because I've heard Zona, and the thing I always grew up hearing was that like that spotted bass and smallmouth are a lot more visual predators than like a large mouth because like they love clear, deep reservoirs and they will hunt more than a large mouth will. Sure. Like, I mean, compare and contrast that. Do, do you see that the smallmouth, they're, what's their personality difference really between that and a large mouth bass? So, about 20 years ago, I started fishing the, the north branch of the Susquehanna, which um, as another guide, Lance Durham refers to it as the muddy river, right? And Lance has been doing this guiding gig for almost 40 years or maybe over 40 years. I have no idea, wow. but he's been doing it a long time. And so, uh, he's, he's certainly made some comments to me that have really resonated well. And these bass will eat in almost any color of water you can throw mm-hmm. at them. And up there, because of the farmlands, because of the mountains, you could get spit people, three people spit on that mountaintop and it turns the water muddy. Mm-hmm. So if you go down hmm. to Sunbury and watch where the West Branch comes in the North Branch, there is almost always a seasonal mud line that will fade from mm-hmm. east to west, depending on how much rain the North Branch has got. Mm-hmm. Right? Interesting. So you have to know how to fish muddy water if you're going to be successful on the north branch you have to know how to fish high muddy water and deal with it because it's it's a weekly experience it's certainly rare that i can see five feet down in the, in the north branch i guess everything is relative because if a fish grows up in a dirty water place like what they're not going to not eat yeah right? yeah and they're going to use what they have and they're la- so those bass might use their lateral line more than on the delaware where it's you can see you you can read a born on date on a, on a Budweiser can in mm-hmm. ten foot of water, right? I mean, but so, it's kind of like too. I keep thinking, and you're so right though, because like fishing a lake at night, and you were talking about diving earlier. But if you you can go twenty foot deep and it's dark out, there's no light down there, and you could drag a jig on the bottom, mm-hmm. and I think, and and you're gonna get bit. You get bit, you know, maybe more so uh, because they're they're more apt to be out. They're not as worried about predation and stuff yeah. so but the, the idea too and putting yourself in there kind of like you said blind even a blind person you talk about their senses i heard somebody say the other day about you know blind person their their senses of hearing smell our eyes were you mm-hmm. know but for a fish for them to eat you are right that vibration that motion that's their world and when they swim like we see them swimming we don't feel that but if you're in that water, you can feel that vibration and that's for them to eat. And, and I really think that people need to realize that if you've ever ever mm. been in ever spent any time diving in the river, it's a noisy place. Yes. I mean I've I've 
I've been in Mexico and other places, you know, with my snorkel gear and, mm -hmm. and, you know, it, it's placid. It's just wonderful. It's, you know, you hear, you can actually hear, you know, sometimes when a fish swims by you mm -hmm. on the river, it is noisy. It is. I mean, I can hear a boat, you know, a quarter mile away, take wow. it off, right? You can hear it. It's noisy that the current that's flowing, huh. the stuff that's coming down, it's noisy. So these, these fish are, are used to noise, used to noise, mm -hmm. right? They're not, you're not going to spook. Now, right. don't get me wrong, a summer day and it's bluebird sky, you got right. to make long casts and do that mm -hmm. stuff. But I mean, they're used to noise. They may not like it, but they're used to it. So it's a noisy place already. Mm -hmm. So they have to be able to, to, that's why that frequency thing is, is, I mean, mm -hmm. I think bait companies that would figure that frequency out would be, mm -hmm. you know, to their advantage. But certain baits seem to work better. Certain swim baits seem to be work better for me than others. And I don't think it's color. I don't think it's profile. I don't think it's softness because they don't know until they hit it. Mm -hmm. But I think it's the frequency that that tail produces that really makes it. Does that big frequency cluster. that you think works change depending on the season? Does one frequency work better in the winter than the summer and then fall, vice versa? Or is it I just think that they have a range, just like we have mm -hmm. a color okay. range in our eyes and they have a color range in their eyes, you know, and, and I, you know, being in electronics uh, there's a there's a prism thing that we that we yeah. that we look at so i think that they have colors that they see longer than other colors mm -hmm. and and you know oranges are always pluses but i like i'm a big violet person i like that i think violet's the last color to go even though berkeley who has much much more brains than i do says it's orange because i know like jason christie talked about like having that louder thumping yeah that deeper thump in colder water compared to like right. as the water warms they become more aggressive and that's just interesting to think like how that might change depending on the water temperature or is it because the water colder water sound travels differently than warm and that's where the different sound vibrations play into it we're going way yeah, over I, the top it, there but it yeah. does and i think i think another thing is, is that you have to know your forge we talked about it mm. right so the Delaware River, the Lehigh River, the Juniata River, the Susquehanna River, um, the West Branch, the North Branch, the Susquehanna, this, this stone cat deal here is whether they hate them so much they have to hit them hmm. or whether they taste so good they have to hit them. But if you throw a walleye, if you're fishing for walleye or bass and you put them in your live well, like when I did a, a, a shoot with um, Outdoor Life magazine, they wanted to put the bass in the live well um, to because they would get more brindly color. Even if you caught them, even if you caught a bass that was almost all yellow, they would put them in the live well with a few rocks in the live well. Hmm. And um, and it, the bass would get, you know, hmm. these beautiful, beautiful coloring, colorization on them. What I noticed at the end of the day was with the walleye and the bass is that there would be white, you know, skinless stone cats all over the bottom of my a stone live cat. Well. Matt, we call them Mad Toms. Matt, okay, here, Mad Toms. Same but thing. I'm assuming it's the same thing. Stone well, so cat, biologically they're different. Okay. Right? There's a Mad Tom and a stone cat. Okay. Right. So there, there is a there. They look very similar. Their okay. their tail patterns a little bit different, but I believe and both species exist. But I think the prolific ones are the are the are the, are the, hmm. the, the know that. stone cat. Yeah. So a stone cat or willow cat or mad tom it's or, wider okay. yeah it's yeah a lot, it's a little bit different it's a, it's a little it's a bit lot different wider than like uh, the mad okay. tom so they're they're similar but interesting companies same, like same tail yeah right shape yeah that companies like shape. fit um i think um uh, is it still called what's the other place that makes the mad Toms? oh yeah it is yellow packaging um, yeah that's, so yeah. but that's just having that color you know mm -hmm. and having case. that bait case yeah Plus. case was one of the first ones i've mm -hmm. ever ever used it and had it so charlie had one mm -hmm. and then there was one called bright eyes and then there was you know another one mm -hmm. but fit just seems to the, the the guy from fit who originally came up with it his name was al al Linko, and al was a crotchety old man but he really really was a perfectionist hmm. but every day he would have me send him go out and catch me a stone cat and how, how come that stone cat's different than the color than the other one i say oh, I don't know. I did what you asked me to do. Here's here's what it looks like. So I would literally freeze these things. And then when he would come to a trip, I would give him the frozen one. He would go home and try to mold it or put it against That's his. Awful. So he was he was to the point where I would catch him live once. He would put him in a tank and look at how the, the tail was moving so he could develop That's his tail. Awesome, That's do insane. It. He was he was he was a love hate type of guy. He just was, you know, he he was you couldn't tell him anything, right? You, mm -hmm. if the sky was purple. You know, blue, he would say it was purple, right? Just, but he would, when it came to bait development, hmm. he was very, very particular. I mean, he threw away more baits than most people would have ever. I mean, he was just. That's crazy. Crazy. That yeah. Pretty cool. But the guys who are running it are trying to, you know, keep it at his standards and they're trying different colors and things like that. But I'm a big fan of, you know, purple, a big fan of yellows and oranges. And like, you know, someone's saying, if you, if you could only fish with one bait, what would it be? I think for me, it's a swim bait, mm -hmm. but it would be certainly be a certain color as a swim baits mm -hmm. I want to have on the boat 
What's your tackle setup for for swim baits and throwing a, a Ned Rigger tube? Uh, this past week, I throw uh, I throw um, I like spinning gear for my soft plastics. I really do, especially if I'm throwing a, a 24th, a 16th, an eighth. I rarely go over an eighth. Okay. I rarely. I mean, I'll go to a 3 16th, but I rarely. If I'm going to go heavier, I'll go to a bait caster. Um, I like super lines for anything on a touch bottom width. That's a soft plastic with a leader line of 20, you know, 24 to 36 inches. A lot of guys like seven foot leaders, but on these smaller sensitive rods, you have all, not, not the micro guides, even, mm -hmm. even the regular guides are small and that not going through the line just drives mm -hmm. me nuts. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause it can cause backlash problems mm -hmm. in your bait caster. It can cause other problems. So when I'm fishing for, with soft plastics, you know, I'm throwing it on, on super lines, you know, I, I like the torque that the gamma has, or I don't think it really matters. It just that's what I use, mm -hmm. but I like 10 or 15 pound test cause I can't get 12 most places. And I use a 10 pound leader. What's your and knot I, that you like to tie for your leader knot? Uh, it's a, it's a reverse Albright. Okay. I call it the crazy Alberto or other people do as well, mm -hmm. but I can tie it in the wind. It, you know, in the knot wars TV thing, they showed that it was one of the strongest ones they've ever tied. Mm -hmm. And I just like it to me. It's just easier to tie. It's strong. And if I have to tie less leader on during the day, it's a win for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I have days when guys will break off 10, you know, two guys will break off, you know, 15 to 20 times. And <sighs> I, if I don't have to tie leaders on every, every time they do that, it's just a plus. So mm -hmm. nothing against the uni knot, nothing against all the other knots that they have out there. And I, you know, the FG knot's great, but you need six arms to tie that damn thing. Right? Yeah. So, it's, uh... And if you don't go through the right way, it just pulls, I just, I don't have time for it. Mm -hmm. So it's probably the better knot, but boy, it's tough to tie in the wind, tough to tie on the boat. Yeah. You need the guys that can hand. do it. Yeah are probably not tying for two extra angles on the boat, right? Mm -hmm. So good for them. They are. What yeah. is that chili willy uh, so, imitating? I know you. I think if you've ever watched, I mean, I don't really know it. If you've ever watched anything that crawls along the bottom, right? It or burrows. So, you know, your crayfish sometimes lift the crawl. Uh, your, your stone cats will try to burrow. And all right. you ever do is see is a tail. Um, a lot of your nymphs that will crawl, like mm -hmm. especially your bigger ones, those dragon, those drop, those giant dragonfly nymphs, mm -hmm. they move kind of a, at a way where they kind of just lay on the bottom. The way that this bait works is, it it's almost like a Ned type bait. Where, if you could hold up to the camera just one yeah, time sorry. so I can screenshot it one time, perfect. There you go. That's all you got to so do. So <laughs> this bait holds on a Ned, you know, a Midwest Ned head or a okay. Z Man Ned head really well. And it sticks up and all this moving is that tail. Okay. So in the winter time, you can fish it hmm. without even moving it. And that tail is just flopping back and forth. I'm with you. And so it looks like something that's trying to escape. It's, it looks something that's, that's alive. Mm. That subtle action. Yeah. yeah. And, and in the, in the springtime, you can rip it and let it fall. So it, 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 it the, that tail does it like any paddle tail will do, right? Hmm. Just it'll rip and it, let it fall. That looks a lot like the Japanese stuff that's coming out mm -hmm. now, where it's yeah. like those massive ones that they have now. Mm -hmm. But it looks yeah. like I, that, and honestly, it's interesting. It's, it's it's just an adaptation of the old Erie darter. Huh. Right? It's very oh, similar okay. to the Erie darter, which I used to argue with Al. But the Erie darter was longer and it had a longer tail, and I'm sure they work. But this profile. And this color, I mean, it's just shit. I'm gonna have to buy that colors. now. No, no, it's <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> but I mean, th you know, whether it's poor boys, eerie daughter, yeah. or whether it's this, I mean, I just think that. So you can fish it standalone on that head. You can put it on the back of a hair jig, or yeah, and they have different rubber, sizes. They like have three different trailer. sizes, right? Right. You can throw it on a hair jig. They make a really, it's called a Willy really wannabe. You can put it on the back of a hair jig. And that hair just wants to disperse, but this mm -hmm. thing just lays behind the hair mm -hmm. and does this. So it's just you. It's uh, sorry, I didn't yeah, you. No. Yeah, interesting point. Because you guide, and I, God knows how much terminal tackle you go through. What kind of head do you set this stuff up with? Because I know, like the Ned head, mm -hmm. the mushroom head, it is fantastic at not coming back to the boat mm -hmm. and getting snagged on every pebble. Like, do you have a specific kind of head, jig head you like to use for your clients? The Midwest head, I, I, I use. I'm never going to get a Z band sponsors for this. I don't <laughs> like their hooks. I, I, I don't mm -hmm. know if it's because when they when they mount that keeper, which is a wonderful keeper, mm -hmm. I have too many of those hooks breaking on me. I mean, mm -hmm. they break on a big fish, they break on a on a mm -hmm. on a rock, yeah. or they weaken and you get a big fish and you lose it. It's tough to lose those fish. Mm -hmm. So I like a VMC hook or a mustad hook on a Midwest head. A if Midwest I could head? get yeah, Midwest is just a net. Mm -hmm. It's like very mm -hmm. similar to the Ned head, mm -hmm. 
Um, Z-Man has perfected it. They Z-Man's, did come out with a different, yeah, heavier gauge because that that, mm-hmm. old, that original one, it was it was a thin and that's wire better. gauge. And the it, problem is, is when you go too heavy on the gauge, right. the bait doesn't tip Correct. up. So if you practice There's it, a, I, right, I right. practice in a tub, right? I want to see what weight head and what length bait is mm-hmm. going to work in. So, I mean, I won't throw us on a 3 16th because it won't tip the bait up. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Where a Z-Man 3 16th with a Z-Man product We'll tip the bait up. Okay. So you know you got to play with it. Z-Man makes, I mean, they make the best, mm-hmm. some of the best soft plexes I've ever used. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm just not crazy about their hardware. Mm-hmm. Now their bigger stuff is great, mm-hmm. but it doesn't tip the bait up, which takes right, away from why sense. I'm using no, it. So, true. I mean, if it's the difference between a chatter bait, of course, the Z-Man chatter bait, yeah. just mm-hmm. no question there, right? But when it comes to the the hooks, I just I don't like them on our river because it's. It's just a snag I ever cast. Right. You're dealing with a rock, mm-hmm. and you know if you're on a lake, you probably don't have that problem. And they're not, you know, they're not in business to 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 make baits for me, mm-hmm. right? Make lure, make heads for me. But just on the Susquehanna, mm-hmm. it's just I don't like them. Speaking of Z-Man, if if you had to have a fight between a tube and the Ned Rig, it, it's so crazy because uh, we just did an interview with a guy that just won a tournament up on the Upper Potomac. And it's so funny that the tube is king and no one fishes the Ned Rig, but yet every major elite series or MLF event, mm-hmm. they're going, they're, they're all fishing Ned Rigs, very few tubes. Is that culturally just because of these areas or is there something about the tube that's different than the Ned Rig? So the tube gives more motion, right? And there are days when the tube is king. There's okay. no question, right? I don't think the tube comes back as often. So the Ned Rig is preferred. Mm. So the tube is, I fished side by side with one of the best tube fishermen I've ever known. His name is Todd. I just... I've never seen anybody fish a tube, but the way this guy fishes a tube. And I've I've outfished him on Ned style rigs or hmm. chili willies or things like that on some days. But the tube has always got a place. Hmm. It's just how much movement those tentacles are going to give you mm-hmm. on that okay. on that versus the this more subtle bait. And sometimes more movement is not what you want. But on the Susquehanna, where crayfish are so prominent, I've seen guys throw Ned bombs from missile baits. I've mm-hmm. seen guys throw, I don't like the TRD, but guys like to throw them. I prefer to throw a, a, a hula stick, even if I had to cut it down because I, mm-hmm. in my mind, that little tentacles mm-hmm. makes a difference. But they work. Mm-hmm. And if guys aren't catching them on this because they're not throwing them, mm-hmm. they do work. But there's no question. They're not right. sexy, mm-hmm. right? They're not, it's not, you know, and you will catch a lot of smaller fish on a smaller profile bait. You just will. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't mean you're not going to catch a four pounder on it also. But the Ned rig, if you don't have it, it's it's it just from a guy perspective you're, you're tying on less lures you're catching more fish it's a stupid lure but it yeah, works it works and it's not so, sexy yeah. that's so interesting about the tentacle factor with a crayfish mm-hmm. i just i never would have thought about how important that is to have mm-hmm. those little bit of a pendulum bit of movement. movement you talked about that little z-man the little tube too the mini tube yeah yeah which is really good too and yep. a real good one on the new river but nothing i was thinking about too is because what you're talking earlier about the burrowing, a lot of times too, if you look on the bridge of the smallmouth's nose, you'll see where it's because they're going to be. Oh, they're, to they're just, the bridge of their nose, yeah. the bottom of their nose. They're yeah. they're, they're cranking. I've I've come by in the Susquehanna because it's, it's going to sound like I'm crazy, but you know everybody thinks a smallmouth is always this way, right? They're always top to bottom, but mm. I've seen smallmouth really? under wow. rocks like that. Think of their dead. Uh huh. Right. So is that right? I don't know if they're dying or if they're resting or if it went in there to try to get something but they're not opposed to to, that right? to torpedoing and going into a rock sideways that's crazy and i've seen it where i poked them and they they come flying out of there like is it's that like right? oh that fish is dead because it's laying and it's it's almost all i see is you know it's laying under a rock halfway and i'll say oh that thing is dead oh what a shame what a beautiful small mouth and you poke it with a with a rod and the thing just disappears that's crazy that's wild. but i mean I don't know if it's foraging or mm-hmm. I, I don't know. And I don't see a lot, but I mean, I've seen it enough times ago. They turn sideways. Mm. On Z-Man and baits too. Um, and you talked all about this also in a bladed bait. And I'm assuming you're talking about the chatter bait and back to vibration frequency, chatter bait, the regular chatter bait, original versus the jackhammer. Okay. Sadly to people's pocketbooks, the jackhammer, is amazing now and i and i'm going to say too because of doc hefko i go up with him a little bit to the susky and one of those things three to one four to one jack hammer to the original and from that time i'm like i don't know what it is but anytime you get out fished by somebody it's like and it is and now i'll know some people travis talked about mm-hmm. um 
Luger, Travis Luger talked about liking throwing the original because it was different. Some people are looking for something different, but there is something about the jackhammer. They I both work. It. It's, they but both the jackhammer work, but is a vibration is it's so so if you guide with me regularly, please turn this off right now. <laughs> what I'll do sometimes is I'll do it with crank baits, I'll do it with jerk baits, I'll do it with chatter baits. I will give somebody something and the guy's catching it. Mm-hmm. And I'll say, hey, I want to change that out. And I'll change it out. And I'll put the old style on mm-hmm. and take the jackhammer to the other guy. Just to see. Just to see. Because mm-hmm. that guy wasn't catching. And now, and all of a sudden, the guy in the front of the boat's catching. And the other guy in the there back is go. not catching. Yeah. So you can't do that as many times as I've done it. Right. And not and go, not, yeah. there's something to this. Wow. Is there 15 more dollars into that thing? Probably not. But good for Z-Man for capitalizing on that situation. But... If if I if one fish mattered to me, mm-hmm. the jackhammer would be the I, only thing. I, I, I agree that there's something about how they make it because I am a big, big swim bait guy. Mm-hmm. I have uh, I have like two swim baits that are six hundred dollars a pop. And <laughs> I just know because I the I caught a twelve and a half pounder out of a pond throwing one of those big gliders. And uh, I know that a a more expensive glider, when you crank that handle, the way it just, just mm-hmm. slowly goes, there is something about yeah, the way they me, the yeah. way they build it that it just has something mm-hmm. a little different there in it. Mm-hmm. And I just think with jack like with the jackhammer, I think it's because of the the quality of the metal they use, it mm-hmm. creates a different vibration when it hits. It, it's not as yeah. cheap. And I was saying that too, there's something to be said, like you said about color. There's yeah. always that's the thing about fishing is nothing is ever absolute. Yeah. It's not an exact science. I mean, there's days where anything you throw. Oh, yeah. And yes. those are the days where you're throwing the literally you're throwing the best marketable thing you can throw right. rather than taking a chance of hanging that jackhammer right. up mm-hmm. in that grass I was talking about before and losing it. Right. So, you know, it's just one of those things where if I need a bite, I've got them in there, but yeah. I still have the originals and I still have some knockoffs too that, 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 I, that I work and they work fine. But on those days when you too, need though, it, subtle, like the willow, uh, mm-hmm. like, you know, or just or the, the smaller, like it's sometimes they want it subtle and they don't want that big. Listen, I, I got guys so. who will swear up and down about the Walmart spinnerbait. And I'm not that guy. Yeah, right. I I want to have a certain size. Mm-hmm. I want to be able to throw it on a spinning bait mm-hmm. and on a and on a, a, a casting rod. I want to be. I want it to, the profile to be right. I want the blaze to spin. Profile, yeah. I want to yeah. make sure that you know I have all worth hardware on if I can get it. And and that's how I am. I don't want the one dollar. Well, because you want a high percentage yeah. catch rate too. Yeah. I mean that's what you're doing, and you want you want people catching so but i mean I, I one of the best stories i have is came from a seven-year-old girl that t- went to the st- bait shop the day before and bought this god-awful swim bait that looked like some kind of psychedelic puke it was pink <laughs> and orange and white and it had some kind of a skirt on the front of it and it had a big weight on it just completely against the way i finesse fish mm-hmm. and she goes do you think i'll catch anything on this and i said no I really don't think so, but it's pretty. And so she put it on and two casts later, she caught a fish. And then, so the rest of the day I heard, you, you said I wouldn't catch it on that. So I mean, right. it meant I was, my, my words were worth nothing mm-hmm. that day, but I've long stopped telling people oh, that won't work. Yeah. You know, like I told mm-hmm. you the day where I was catching bass in clear water on a clear, very clear, much clearer than this jerk bait. And a guy put a parrot one on, you know, parrot mm-hmm. is pink and yellow mm-hmm. and bright yeah, and right. he threw it out in this clear spot right. i'm thinking i could see that thing a country mile mm-hmm. you're not gonna bang he catches a fish on it shut your mouth and let the fish that's do right. what they want yeah, yeah. Exactly right. and, and that's why so guys when you know when i do my saturday morning live streams and i always get questions like well what color would you pick well first off if you're a true angler you're a tackle junkie never just buy one and when it comes to baits that have colors you need a couple colors because i i can always tell you bone on a cloudy day on like Anna, but guess what for some reason that might not just be working like have a couple in your boat mm-hmm. just in case because you never know now in the, in the article too you on that blade of bait are you how are you fishing that are you fishing that more like a jig and like kind of popping it up or it depends. Did I misread that it depends i i like to i like a, i like to throw it into something to cover mm-hmm. right it so guiding versus fishing on your own two different ways you want to run your boat right? when you're guiding if i fish it the way i would fish it by myself i'm going to cut that guy off he's never going to get a chance the front guy's only going to so when i when i guide i sit in the middle of the boat mm-hmm. and run everything off of remote control i don't i don't mm-hmm. i'm never on the front deck unless there's an issue you're running all trucks I'm or running a, a Trova, Trova. Or, right, or the Ultra. Okay, gotcha, so gotcha. I don't ever go on the front deck unless I have to be on mm-hmm. the front deck. That gives the front deck person all the room and the back deck person, and I'm equidistant for netting and tying mm-hmm. and changing lures. Mm-hmm. And I have my own little cockpit, plus my head is lower 
than where they're casting, so I'm a little bit safer. So, you know, it, there's a reason for it. But my workspace is that cockpit area. So if I was fishing a tournament throwing that bait, I would burn my trolling motor batteries out really quickly by going upriver, getting along something and climbing upriver and throwing it up along the bank mm -hmm. so that as those fish, or it could be a bank, it could be an island, it could be a rock ledge, it could be a piece of cement, it could be the middle of the river, but wherever it is, I'm throwing it upriver, that chatterbait, and bringing it down in my strike zone mm -hmm. versus... You know, if they're five feet off the shoreline, you throw that, you're, you're in the strike zone the whole time, mm -hmm. right? Can't do that when I'm guiding. When I'm guiding, I've got to stay off and let both guys pick mm -hmm. and hope that they don't miss a section of that, mm -hmm. that, 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 that fish is on. So I think spinner baits, um, top water, um, um, some of your slash baits, mm -hmm. chatter baits work best throwing it mm -hmm. upriver and bringing it down mm -hmm. like where it's natural. The crankbait doesn't seem to make, really make much of a difference, and you'll get less snags if you don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot do that with a tube, right? You throw the tube upriver, <laughs> you make it in the back, mm -hmm. right? You've got a quarter down and, mm -hmm. and kind of sweep it, like the swim bait and things like that, because it's just too mean of a place. Mm -hmm. But, you know, crankbaits, chatterbaits, spinnerbaits, they'll come through that stuff just mm -hmm. fine. And I think that, you know, guys always think that they have to sweep it down river, but if those if you're getting your strikes mm -hmm. two foot from the shoreline, why not spend your time, mm -hmm. you know, working that way up? Now you'll kill your batteries. Mm -hmm. You know, you got an eight-hour day. You're not gonna, you're, most batteries aren't going to give you eight-hour day. In, in Are you current. running lithiums or, or no. what are your thoughts on lithiums? No. I guess? So I, scientifically, I love the idea of lithiums, but I don't trust the Chinese. Okay, so fair enough. Not the not the people, <laughs> but the engineers there, because I've worked with them in, for many many years, and I'll tell you, they'll always tell you what you want to hear, because that's their culture. They never want to disappoint. So you may buy a one hundred um, series lithium battery that's got somebody's name on it but if you test it it might be a 44 a 48 a 49 mm -hmm. so unless you've got a reputable place that you can get a 100 amp hour system you just don't know what you're getting so that's interesting because that's the big thing right now and in, in you see with bass uh, listen, i won't so mention names because i want to get them in trouble no, no no but i have friends who fish the pro series uh -huh. who have contracts with lithium battery places that burn interstate batteries because oh, wow. they do not want to be out on the lake and have their batteries go completely dead on them without warning even though you have the thing that shows you they they would rather have the slow decline of a of their other even though their base even their batteries are free mm -hmm. and i can tell you that i fished with one of your one of your uh, clients here and we were having one of the best ac's he's ever had in the river and his batteries died hmm. lithium batteries died in short period of time now could have been a charging issue could have been a lot of things but you just don't have that with with mm. flooded batteries. Interesting. And since my clients are my first concern, they're going to get the battery that I trust the most, not have to worry about charging issues. They do work, but when they work, they're great. When they don't work, they're terrible. So from, from your more of like, from your engineering background and stuff, is is lithium just a hype right now? Or do you think in oh, no, 10 to is, 20 years, like lithium lithium's batteries? Gonna be better. Okay. Lithium's going to be better. Uh, it's it's the recyclable properties of it, I'm not so sure that are there, mm -hmm. but they're better. They're more te the technology thing. The problem is that everybody's rushing on the scene and you don't know if you're getting a Sanyo quality battery or that battery they give you in the kid's gift that it has like an orange wrapper on it that has no name on it. Interesting. Not all batteries are the same. Not all charging systems are the same. If you have four wires going into your charger, you know, if you open it up and you see four wires, your lithium batteries are not going to last. They all have to, they have to have multiple wires going to them so they can monitor the monitor it. It needs to be CPU controlled. And a lot of the a lot of them are doing that now, right? I'm just saying that if you do research on lithium batteries and look at the just at the core level, the cell level, a Sanyo battery is better than a mm -hmm. you know some of the Japanese, some of the Chinese made stuff, right? Not that China's bad, not that people are bad, mm -hmm. but they will tell you it is a 100 amp hour battery and it's a 40 or a 60. And if you're counting on 100 and you're in a tournament or you're guiding for eight hours and your batteries go, wh what have you just done to your clients? Mm -hmm. So if you have a trusted one that you can trust, and there are a few out there that you can trust, but not just the word lithium isn't enough for me to go out there and buy them. So because I am getting new batteries and I'm in the market, could, could you give me like a pick for lithium and a pick for non-lithium that you would think would be like good or just for everybody so at home? Johnson Controls makes a lot of batteries. They make the, the batteries for your interstates. Uh, Walmart used to be Johnson Controls. I don't know who makes them now. DECA batteries are phenomenal, but they're a smaller company. Um, a lot of your um, Duralast batteries are good. It, it, you can usually tell by the weight of the battery if you're looking for a, a flooded battery. Um, 
The problem with flooded batteries is you're probably only get a couple years out of them. Where with your, if you're willing to spend the money, you, I would just say go with a name brand. Try to, you, you'll find cheaper stuff out there. But I would warn you that even though it says 100 amp on it, it may not test at 100 amp hour. Okay. So if you're gonna do it and you're trying to get the batteries for 150 bucks a piece or 200 dollars a piece, you're probably better off going with, you know, a hundred dollar, 120 dollar flooded battery. If you're willing to spend the 800 dollars on the batteries that you need to get your 24 or 36 and get that system worked up, then lithium is a way to go. But you have to be willing to know that not every lithium battery is the same quality. Interesting. So that's really a cool. lot of guys yeah. will get huh. lithium batteries thinking, I mean, I have I have direct contact to the engineers at work at, at some of the best electric car companies in the world. Well, mention names because don't get in trouble. No, 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 no. But I can call them up and say, hey, what what battery cell, base cell is the best cell? And they'll tell me mm -hmm. this is what we're using when we build stuff for the government. This is what we're using mm -hmm. when we're doing trials for, you know, Tesla. Right, because that's their, their engines that used to work for me. So I also know he says stay your stay away from X battery from China. Just stay away from it. Interesting, because mm -hmm. they say hundred amp hour, mm -hmm. but they're not. There, there's no way they can ever be. Or the quality control is bad. Is this one's a hundred? The next one you get out of the mm -hmm. box is forty four. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying that do some research. Yeah, yeah do, do some, some research. research. Don't and and that's a good point. And you you can get a guy that swears by this brand, another guy who gets it in their junk. So mm -hmm. because the quality control is just not mm -hmm. there. So. You know, a lot of it depends on how hard you use it, what what amp hour rating you're getting. I would get always higher than you think you need. And it's unfortunately right now, the technology is not quite there where it's cost effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, a lot of guys who are doing it running double systems, meaning they have two, three thousand dollar system on their boat. So in case one fails during the during the tournament, it's just it's just, right. But it's, it's a lot of money. Yeah. Crazy. And when you got an old technology, right, it's like it's an old technology. It mm -hmm. flooded batteries work and I get 16 months out of them. And I can turn them over every year or every 16 months and they cost me $300 and I can trust them. Mm -hmm. And I know how, I know how they can charge it. Mm -hmm. But the benefit to, to these other batteries and the lithium is you can charge them faster. You can charge them as fast as you want. As much power as you can give them, mm -hmm. you can charge them. Mm -hmm. you, there's just so many things that you can do with lithium you cannot do with these other batteries. Mm -hmm. you, lithium's amazing. But like a power drill, when it goes out, right. it doesn't yeah. slow down. It just... It's out. No, right. that's just interesting because I know, like, again, like if you if you watch anything, like whether it's FLW or Bassmaster Classic, like you have just so many commercials for like the power port charge system and then lithium, lithium, lithium. Mm -hmm. But it's just interesting because you like you need to kind of know this stuff, mm -hmm. like the pros and cons of it before you right. fork the, out a thousand bucks per battery. Yep. Mm -hmm. And and, so, and like I said, there are some that are just quality and great stuff. But mm -hmm. you know, you you talk to people who have lithiums, but they also have at home mm -hmm. a three battery, uh, flooded battery backup because they've had days where either the charger unit went bad or the, the, the it, what happens is every so many microseconds, it's checking to make sure really? the batteries, well, when you're charging them, make sure the batteries get to the perfect temperature and they're charging. And once they're charged, it turns it off. Hmm. But there's multiple cells in every 12 volt unit. So it's charging each group of cells differently on each battery. So you have to have a smart charger. Mm -hmm. You have to have a lithium batteries that's got quality. And if a base in your base system, one of those lower voltage batteries goes bad, those subcomponents go bad, you're going to start drawing from the other batteries. It's just like getting a short in, a, in, a, in any battery. So you just have to be aware of what, what you're doing. And just because hmm. it says lithium or just because there's a commercial about it, doesn't make it make it the yeah. best thing in the water. I came yeah. here for smallmouth and I figured out what battery I'm going to buy. Like, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm not talking <laughs> you out of it. I'm just saying you no. got to spend the money if you want something. And again, guys will come in here and say, listen, I bought this battery. It was 800 bucks and it's dynamite. Another guy comes in and bought the same battery. It wasn't the same quality. So. It's just, you're not going to get the consistency that you'll get out of it. And that's what you're paying for. Mm -hmm, the you're paying yeah. for the name, you're paying for the advertising, and you're paying for the test quality of the, the mm -hmm. hardware you're getting. <sighs> We're, you know, I mean, you can get by with Walmart batteries. You can get by with, mm -hmm. I, mean, I really like my interstates. I think I trust the interstate batteries. Well, especially if you're fishing a river where, yeah, your, your trolling motor is just constant, especially with spot locks now mm -hmm. where like, yeah, you want that constant power. Like you need to make sure that day in and day out. And what you makes a lithium switch. last longer is they, the computer will not allow those things to go down to a depth of discharge that you can get right. in, ah. a, in an older technology. So guys will say, oh, I got five years out of my flooded batteries. It's because they've never taken their depth of discharge below 50%. Mm -hmm. Where me, every day, mm -hmm. I'm at 40, mm -hmm. 45, 30, <sighs> right? I've destroyed these batteries. That's why I get 
eight, 16 to 18 months out of them. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Right? That's crazy. Along those same lines, you were talking before about fish moving. Like, so how, when you go on to, you know, seasonally too, you're going to kind of start down and you're going to kind of have an idea where they are, but what mm -hmm. goes through your mind or what, how do you, how do you adapt to, like, you get in there and they're not where you think they're going to be? What, where do you kind of, do you have a mental game plan so this of is, how you so, find them? This, so for, and I never go back to the same, I try not to go back to the same place every day. If I, okay. if I can avoid it, if the wind, unless the wind can, conditions don't mm -hmm. change and i have no other option i try mm -hmm. not to go back to the same place gotcha. day after day after day mm -hmm. and i'm not faulting the guys that do mm -hmm. i just try not to so the other day i had one angler and he had 70 something bass in the boat wow. and he had him in six hours one angler i didn't they were just there mm -hmm. i went back two days later and in two hours two anglers good anglers had six bass in the boat it's a six hour trip mm -hmm. six bass you know you do the math it isn't going to work so the bat either the bass are here and they're not eating or and we have to fight this or the bass have moved a few miles up river following this this on their way to spawning areas even though the spawn's not for you know weeks yet and so i, I said listen guys buckle down we're going to go six miles and get on the same bank but six miles up river when six miles up river and you know it started slow and all of a sudden we had a pot of fish they ended the day with 60 fish i don't think i would have had them if i would stay down river hmm, i wow. think that group of fish i was fishing right? That big group moved up river, hmm. you know, on their way to a creek or an ledge system or something they were going to feed on. And I had to intercept them again. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. So was I lucky? Was it because of where I, I have no idea, right? But my guess is, since there's no tracking system on there, that these fish are constantly moving up in pods. And so, you know, that day I caught all those fish and didn't move the boat more than 500 yards was, was I was in the pod. Mm -hmm. And the next day, since I wasn't there, I couldn't follow them, but they had moved a couple miles up river. And now that same pot of fish is, is on its way three miles below the creek. And the sad part is if we get that the, if the weather stays warm, they're going to go up the creek and all the guys in the creek are going to catch them, but they're going to go up so far in the creek, the boats can't get to. And, you know, that group of fish is now not mm -hmm. in my pool of fishing. And I'm guessing you're probably not spending a lot of time in a given area either. Probably. No, if like, I'm not just, catching, if you're I'm not, not catching them. You're out. You're... I don't argue with fish yeah. or women. <laughs> or women. That's right. a that's a that's a t-shirt. So I just don't. So it, <laughs> if the if the fish show me something they want, mm -hmm. I'm not going to right. not throw orange because that's I think it's a dumb yeah. color. Yeah. If the fish eat it, I'm going to throw it till they stop eating it. Mm -hmm. If they want the jerk bait to sit longer or mm -hmm. be jerked more, I'm going to do it because that's mm -hmm. what they want. So. I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to adapt. And I think that's what makes people mm -hmm. good anglers, right? Is that you're willing to adapt mm -hmm. and see, oh my gosh, I caught that fish five feet below a certain current mm -hmm. seam on this kind of a swing pattern. And that I'm going to do that till it doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And once I exhaust that, I'm going to go to another spot that I think has the same thing. Right. Even if that spot is four miles up river. What, um, one question that I had was what is the, the perfect flow rate for this time of year or what's a flow rate? How does the flow rate then affect the positioning of the fish? So food, current speed, which is flow rate and temperature are all somehow into some kind of beautiful calculation I have not mm. figured out. <laughs> so, but they all play a role, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if the, if, if the, as you notice when the river's high, you can fish real tight to the bank even in bright sun and still catch those fish because they're in that calm area. The other day when the river was still quite high, but wasn't nearly as high as it, those fish were off a cast and a half off the shoreline, even though the river was at six foot, 6.18 to be, and the day, be, two days before when I was fishing, it was at seven, but they had moved from that area, mm -hmm. not only locationally upriver, but also out from the bank. So sometimes you think you have to explore a little bit and find out mm -hmm. what current speed they want to be in. You have to be in the trench. In the summertime, mm -hmm. they want to be, I found them, they'll be deep on some days when it's hot and they'll mm -hmm. be in fast current. In other days, those big lunkers are in 10 inches of water hmm. near grass. Hmm. And the only thing you're going to catch them with is a soft fluke, like a, like a, 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 a fit uh, darter, mm -hmm. you know, those soft shads. Or Charlie Case used to make that SSS, mm -hmm. you know, that salty sinking shad. Those are dynamite baits, you know, in the summertime because you can cast them a country mile, you cast them on clear mono, you know, and and they just That's bass will hit them, you know, hit them, and you can you can fish them slow enough in ten inches of water where these big bass are sometimes, and I've also had them where you needed a Ned rig on a you know, on a eighth ounce Ned rig slow fishing it in six seven foot of water which is deep, 
mm-hmm. you know, in the summertime. That's interesting. So really, it's not something like you can like wake up in the morning before you go out and guide, check I your think you have an idea, but you got to learn to adapt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. you got to be able to adapt. Right. I mean, if, if the flow rates, if the river came up a foot and a half, mm-hmm. go to the bank, go behind an island. You know, don't don't fight yourself out. We had in the mm-hmm. day before when it wasn't that high. You now know, start yeah. in. The other thing is that sunlight in the summertime. So guys will go, oh, we killed them on the bank this morning until about nine o'clock. When that sun came up, the fish just stopped eating. Mm-hmm. So no, they didn't. They're under your boat. Move out. Mm-hmm. So they were, they were, you know, they, they were naturally in there feeding because at night they feed it closer to the shore or close mm-hmm. to an island or in the shallows. And as the sun comes out, it starts to bother their eyes. No difference than us putting a pair of sunglasses on. They don't have sunglasses for them. So they, 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 they just drop off the shoreline a little mm-hmm. bit. So I'll see guys fishing, you know, They'll, I call them bank robbers. They're back in the banks, back in the banks, back in the banks, back in the bank. And they're catching in the morning. And all of a sudden, their bike goes, oh, the fish shut off. And then just move out another boat length and start fishing. They're, they're still there. Mm-hmm. They're just deeper. They're, mm-hmm. they're two, three, four foot deeper. For, for, if, you're, if you have that kind of bank. Okay. And for safety, because I know we talked about Travis mm-hmm. Eden about like, you know, if we have a current rate up here at Front Royal, mm-hmm. this, like you, it is safe for you to be waiting mm-hmm. or being out of kayak down here. But depending like, when is the river, like for people at home that want to like maybe make a trip up uh, to kayak or something on the river, when is it not safe? Is there anything that they can look at to be like, all right, we shouldn't, like anytime it rains, just don't go? Or no, is there a certain it, level? So it's a big river. So you could get a lot of rain up river and it takes a day or two for that mm-hmm. to to go down to, okay. to, to show itself down river. So I would really look at the up river gauge and look at the down river gauge. Cause usually two. So if you're fishing Harrisburg, you can just look at Harrisburg gauge cause it's not going to affect it. But mm-hmm. if you're fishing places like Montgomery's ferry or, you know, up closer to Liverpool, you might want to look at what the, what, what the Harrisburg gauge is doing and what the ceilings grow gauge is. Mm-hmm. Or it's actually the interesting, the, the, it's not Sling Grove, it's Sunbury. Okay. So look at those two gauges because the Juniata is mm. the second or third largest flow rate to that. So it can, ah. if that gets flood west where the west branch is getting something, it may change it and it may feel like four feet in Harrisburg. When you get mm. to Sunbury, it might be closer to five foot in Harrisburg or, wow. or lower. So just having that, because it's such a big river, having that ability to look at it. Uh, kayakers, I really like unless you're real seasoned, I really like that four and a half or less, right? Mm-hmm. All the way down as low as it gets. Cause you can, you're just safe. And I like temperatures that are, you know, conducive, like 50 degrees or warm. Okay. But you know, you have your Jeff Littles and these other people under mm-hmm. Juan Brutes that fish year round and mm-hmm. they dress accordingly. I think if you're going to go out in higher conditions, uh, you don't want to learn a new water in higher conditions. I think in a, in a kayak right. or a canoe, I, I think that, you also don't want to be by yourself, right? Mm. So I think the general rule is to go with three people and not all in the same boat, right? So if you're going to be in a paddle craft and you're unsure of it and it's higher or colder, having three people gives you a rescue mm-hmm. scenario that that's, you wouldn't have on your own. really smart, yeah, guys. You look at that, that one video where that boat, that, I mean, it, and again, it's that just sheer force and current and got lodged in the rocks and was, I mean, it's it becomes it's a strainer. And it's, I mean, yeah. it's for the weekend angler also making that trip up there has never been there you talk about 10 different public ramps or access points what would be maybe the, your top five that people could consider um putting in taking out that type of thing so i mean if, if you're looking at harrisburg proper mm-hmm. you you have you have city island mm-hmm. right which is pretty easy to get out of mm-hmm. Um, at certain levels, you got that dam below it though. So I mean, yeah, you just got like, you want to go up river. So you got to go and, up and, river, and, yeah. and when you're learning a new area, I think it's better to go up river anyway, just yes, in case correct. you misread something. You can always float back to the ramp, correct. right? So that is I should have yeah. said that yeah. before. So if you're, if you're testing an area and there is so many ramps, correct. how about picking one that's that's where you're going to go up river from the river, ramp? Right. Mm-hmm. That's right? right. So you, in most cases, you can do that, right? So mm-hmm. if you want to fish uh, Rockville area, you could put it at 400, or you could put it at City Island. If you put in a city island, you're going up river. You can always float back, mm-hmm. right? With with electrical power, electric power, your troll motor. That's really smart, so, guys. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, what side of the river you want to fish? If mm-hmm. if the north branch just got blown up, mm-hmm. and you normally go out of four hunter, right. go out of the Mary the Heritage Park at Marysville, which is right across the river, and it's not going to yeah. have all the debris on the side of the water, mm-hmm. right? So it's not as big of a parking lot, but you have that one. You mm-hmm. have West Fairview. You know, you have Johnny Cunningham's up at the campground at, at to pay launch, but those are. Um, you know, riverfront campground. It's a, it's, yes. a, it's a bit of a rough ru- launch. Yes. But guys put you on the good water. Mm-hmm. Put you on a good you water. Got Middletown way. and then across there's like two airports. Yep. There's one on each side. So you have Middletown, but then there's one that's a little bit further up, closer to the dam on the right. other side. So. And if you're and if you're a guy in a prop boat, I mean there's places you can run a prop boat at certain mm-hmm. levels. Um, um not that I want my phone to blow up, but you could always text or email me or you mm-hmm. know, contact me on Messenger. 
I can give you some pointers. I'm oh, probably cool. not going to give you a yeah. lot of stuff that, yeah. you know, but I, I, I don't like to spend other people's money. Mm -hmm. Meaning I don't want to tell somebody to drive two hours mm -hmm. if I don't think conditions are good. Yeah. And I don't want you to put on the, on the boat and a prop in Fort Hunter at four foot. Cause you're probably not going to be as successful as you would be if it was a five foot or better. Mm -hmm. Right. So. But it's also good to know we've done this. Dave and I did this where, like to your point, where maybe we were doing a three different day, three day deal where you put in on one. Well, the very next day, Fort Hunter, let's say, the very next day, it's blown out because they got rain, you know, north. How far and north then, do I have to go? Can I go yeah, to Juniata? Yeah, yeah. we, we dropped down to Middletown and it was great, you yep. know, or vice versa. I mean, it's yeah. the so, good thing you can pull out. Half day pull out, drive you know half an hour, forty five minutes, chase. put back in. So and... you're chasing the rise. So you know Sunbury's blown yes. up today. I got Harrisburg today, and if I want to go down and fish Goldsboro tomorrow, I can probably do yes. that. Right? <laughs> and then afterwards, I can go back up to to Liverpool, and maybe that stuff's been washed out already. It's already going down river. Now, I actually so had an interesting, interesting story too. We put in on the opposite the Middletown the airport here. We put in and we fished the dam area. My daughter had a, a soccer game in Hershey. So we were going to be up there for the three days. So he took me back, dropped me off. Uh, I went to a soccer game. He continued to fish. When I came back, I noticed on radar that, I mean, just a hellacious storm was coming in. So I told him there was no way I was going to be able to get to him with the trailer to, to pick him up where we put in. But I, so I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to pick you up at Middletown. I said, I need you to come. And the way the storm was tracking, I said, come down river and you'll be looking river left. And I swear, I wish I had a video of it because I'm, had the trailer in the water and I, he's literally coming down the river and I can see the, the storm side black. is dark and it's black <laughs> and muddy. And literally one time I saw a boat come around and I thought it was him and it wasn't him, but, but it was able to work. We were able to get him on the trailer, yep. you know, before the rain. But I think people, people allow the, the anxiousness to get on the water mm -hmm. too early sometimes during the situations. Right. right. So ice is more devastating. Ice and floating trees are more devastating than anything I've ever run into accidentally on the mm -hmm. river. So, I fished an area one day because it was warm and the river was clear. It, there was no ice, none. You know, just let's go out and fish, catching fish. And all of a sudden I start seeing ice come down and more ice come down and more ice come down. Well, just because it's clear in your area, upriver, because water flows from upriver. Mm -hmm. If you get a if you get a, a, a dam break, you know, ice dam break or ice breaks upriver, it's going to lock you in. And mm -hmm. we just got back to the boat ramp before the ice had come in. And jet boats and ice do not mm. do well together because hmm. it lifts the boat and you mm. have no propulsion. Now you're oh, floating dead in the shit. ice. Yeah. Same way with floating debris, like trees and bark mm. and everything. It's like, once your jet intake is clogged, mm -hmm. you have no propulsion. Right. So now you're floating with this debris towards huh. bridges and other mm. stuff. And yeah, you can tie off, but as that stuff's hitting your boat. So it's just one of those things where in those conditions where you know the river might be coming up or mm -hmm. you know that you know it's early in the season, if you launch downriver and go upriver, you can always float back, even in an ice right. dam, and try to get back to the boat. That is just really good, good safety. Advice, yeah. yeah. Anything else you want to talk to before we? No, I, I think you know the you know just just if people have questions, they can. Mm -hmm. It's easier to reach me through Messenger or to send me an email than it would be to call me because I turn mm -hmm. my phone off usually during the trips so that I'm not my customers are getting all my attention, the river's getting all my attention, the boat's mm -hmm. getting my attention. But if um, but if you text or email or message, uh, I'll, I'll usually try to get back to you in a day. And then, guys, all of his information will be linked in the episode description below, so you can get a hold of this man. Um, but thank you so much for coming out with us. Uh, just this has been a lot of fun having you in the Thanks, shop. Thanks, guys. Thanks for Great. having me. Yep. Thanks. And this Great been, shop here, yep. by the way. <laughs> thank you so much. This is Fish in the DMV, guys. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a review. It helps us with Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And we'll see you next time. See ya. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.